two beings merge. from Chopping Mall, and you're listening to The Hysteria Continues. Yeah, and welcome to Hysteria Continues. I think we are up to episode 17, but I may be wrong. Um, a welcome to everyone listening. Thank you for coming back. Um, joined, as ever, by our purveyors of panic. Um, all the way from Ireland, we have Eric. Okay, and in honour of our robot-themed show today, I give you this. <laughs> what a body. <laughs> So uh, it's, tweaky. it's it's supposed to be tweaky from Buck Rogers, but oh, I'm sure right. you guessed that. Yes. That's it. Yes. That's Thank you. Tweaky. I thought you might be Metal Mickey, which you you might be too young to remember. Maybe. I, yes, I do know Metal Mickey, the song and the TV show. Okay. Okay. Well, no, thank you, Eric. And also from the other side of the pond, we have first up uh, Nathan. Hey. Thank you again. <laughs> so I can tell, this, these days. Yeah. I can tell yes. you've been work, you've up all been up all <clears throat> night working on that one, haven't you? Took me all night. Yes. Yes. Well, thank you for that. Thank you. For you. The work has paid off. So thank you, Nathan, and welcome to Joseph. I'm not the first guy who fell in love with a woman he met at a restaurant who turned out to be the daughter of a kidnapped scientist, only to lose her to her childhood lover who she last saw on a deserted island, who then turned out 15 years later to be the leader of the French underground. Wow. Well, that's that's. Um, I would say that's the complete opposite of Nathan's introduction, mm. isn't it? And Lord, I don't. Yeah. I can't place it. That's top secret. Top secret. Okay. Excellent. With Val well, Kilmer. Yes. Brilliant. I thank you very much, uh, Joseph. Um, and and I, ooh, and I I am as ever Justin from the um, Here Syria Lives website and author of Teenage Wasteland. And this week we are looking at um, what you could term arguably well we would say it is a slasher some people may argue it's not a slasher but i think we would all be in agreement here that it is is 1986's chopping mall uh which in case you haven't seen it it's a tale of teenagers being shot in the ass by lasers by very short short <laughs> robots and it's we... arse not ass. <laughs> well, we're going to have an endless discussion, I think, about arse and arse, ass, arse, ass, and all various thin, um, things in between. But we also, amazingly, um, people have said to us about the interviews and they really enjoy them. Uh, this time we have four, yes, count them, four interviews with a cast of Chopping Ball. Coming up for your delicatation, if that's a word, it's a, it's a type of word, so I'm going with it. We have Barbara Crampton, Kelly Maroney, Tony O'Dell and Russell Todd. Um, and you may recognise some of those names from other horror films, especially in the 1980s. So we're going to be coming on to those fairly shortly. Um, so it's a jam-packed episode. And because we've got so many interviews, and so we don't want to go on to a 24-hour podcast, which I know some of you may like, but some of you may not. So we're going to keep it short and sweet this week. Um, we'll be talking about Chopping Mall. Um, we're going to be dissecting it, talking about the making of it, talking to people who worked on Chopping Mall, um, but we're not going to have a top three this week. Um, we're going to have one uh, next time. And I know the feedback we've had, that people really enjoy them, So, but something had to give. But what we are going to do is we're going to talk about our recently seen as ever, because um, I think that's always good fun. So uh, first up, how about you, Joseph? What have you been watching? Well, I saw the 1983, I believe it is, anthology Scream Time, and it was the first time I'd ever seen it, and I really, really loved it, especially the second story. Now, the second story is about a woman and her husband who live in this kind of gothic mansion, and um, there's uh, she starts seeing these apparitions, ghosts, things of that nature, and uh, she thinks she's been crazy, or she thinks she's seeing ghosts, and her husband naturally doesn't believe her. But the thing about this story, it has a really good twist at the end, uh, kind of dealing with uh, the whole thing being predetermined. And 
it's just it's, it's just a really fun movie, and I, I like the first story a lot with the uh, the Punch and Judy dolls. The third story, I with the fairies, I wasn't too keen on. I mean, it had its moments, but those first two stories really make up for the the error of the ways in the third story. But uh, yeah, I would definitely recommend Scream Time. It's a British anthology, and uh, yeah, seek it out. Okay, yeah, I've seen it. I've got interview. Uh, sorry, reviewed it on Hysteria Lives a while back. Um, it's got uh, David Van Day from Dollar. In mm. case you don't know who Dollar, yeah, we saw his is. name in the credits and we made fun of you because in in one of the older shows you mentioned uh, David Van Day from Dollar. Did I? Well, so we we did because I, I brought up the subject of Scream Time. I think in a previous one as well. Yeah. Yes. Have you? And that first episode in the in the film is actually shot in Brighton, which is Justin's old hometown. But she said his name is now Burger Van Day because he runs a burger. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I don't think. Well, no, he's, he's. I think he's back being a pop star ish now. Is he? Oh, he's yeah. back on one of those eighty. Um, I think like in a Butlins kind of way. Um, and do we? Um, have you ever heard any dollar? Because we've got some. I've heard. Of... You've heard of them. I've heard oh, them. Yes. Great track. This is um, in the background while we're talking about it. This is um, Mirror Mirror from Dollar. Um, I can't say they're my favourite 80s pop group. Produced by Trevor Horn. Okay. Yes, and it was um, Theresa May, was Bizarre. it? No, t- no Theresa May's um, politician. No, Theresa Bazaar. Theresa Bazaar, that's right. Yeah, yeah very, very cheesy um, 80s kind of uh, pop duo. But, um, but also... They're like, uh, the ma- they're like the male version of Banana Rama. Kind of, yeah. yeah they're, they're, very, they're very squeaky clean. Um, so, yeah, they are antithesis of punk, I guess. Have you met them in your day job, Eric? I haven't, sadly, no. Would you like no. to? Oh, God, yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe, I still maybe like them, yes. yes. Well, that's probably enough of, of that. But um, I actually have got a trailer here for Screen Time. Would we like to hear that? Oh, yeah. Play it. Okay, well, here we go. Let's um, let's uh, set that up. It's a trailer for 1983's Scream Time. Do you believe in fairies? Do I believe in fairies? Daytime. Nighttime. Playtime. Fright time. It's always time. For Scream Time. Scream Time. Tales of the Supernatural. The Unbelievable. And the Unknown. Tales so bizarre. So unexpected. And so terrifying. You'll be talking about them when you aren't screaming. Scream Time. It's the very latest thing in nightmares. Scream time. Oh, there you go. That is Scream Time, 1983. One of the very few British slasher movies, because although only one of them is a kind of slasher. And uh, interesting fact, um, you're going to be listening to this probably, um, you know, maybe over a month after we recorded it, but... uh, uh, just yesterday, while we we're recording, obviously, um, sad news that Amy Winehouse had died. But the strange link with Scream Time can anyone tell me what the link between Amy Winehouse and Scream Time is? Dave Van Day's uh, hair she is was, bigger than hers. No, <laughs> she was she was killed by a Punch and Judy doll. No, no, you're not you're not close. I'll put you out of your misery. Uh, well, um, despite... Her main the main fan base are fairies. Uh, no, close. Mm-hmm. But um, it's a little bit uh, esoterical, is that the right word? But certainly a little bit kind of out of the ordinary. But um, And you probably wouldn't get this unless you knew it. But she was dumped by recently by a film director, um, Boyfriend, who she proposed to, and he said no. And uh, he directed a film with Charisma Carpenter called Psychosis, uh, a British film last year or the year before, which was a remake of the second episode in Scream Time. Uh, so it was drawn out the the psycho killer coming and the premonitions and everything. It was a drawn out thing. So so there you go. Yeah, you mentioned psychosis in the older one. You said that it was yeah. really awful. It is absolutely dreadful. But anyway, that and was. You said that, that, that she gets bummed by the gardener. Yes, she does. <laughs> that, that doesn't happen in the 1983. Episode, wow, we're just it? referencing all kinds of old episodes today, aren't we? We are. So it's like in w- Family Ties when they used to have those uh, flashbacks. 
Exactly. Yeah, this is one of those. Uh, yeah, those. Uh, we have to cut the budget, so we're basically <laughs> going to do uh, old episodes. Just a to clip show. I think they're called. Yeah, clip Why show. Not, yeah. So. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, um, anything else to say about Scream Time? Did you? You know, you said it was. A, I mean, without giving it away, it's, it's a great twist, isn't it? At the end of that episode. Yeah, it's, it's really fantastic. It's it's sort of like, um, you know. Uh, I'm going to try to say it without spoiling it in case uh, you haven't seen it, but it's basically uh, the thing she sees in the house is it comes upon uh, because of her actions. Like um, uh, at the end, she basically leaves. And if she hadn't le- left, then none of this would have ever happened. It's just a really neat little uh, kind of last minute turn there. I mean, when, when you see the actual, uh, person standing at the door and they're like well you got a lot of help and it shows the painter i was like oh holy shit that was really really clever yeah yeah it's, it's good have you, you seen it nathan and, and eric yes yeah, so i've, I've seen, seen it, it yeah, yeah. Mm. cool excellent well no thank you joseph I w- sorry i would give it an eight out of ten obvious uh probably because it, it's really that good it's one of the better anthologies i've seen in a long time Cool. Excellent. Okay. Well, yeah. That's. Um, I'm glad you had a chance to catch up with that. That's brilliant. And um, how about you, Nathan? What you've been watching? Uh, well, I've seen this one before, but I decided to watch it again. It's uh, the 1970 79 film, The Plumber, uh, the Australian film. I think it's an excellent film, kind of a character study. And I'd be hard pressed to even really call it a horror film. It's more kind of a psychological kind of thing because. You know, if you pick up the media VHS for it, I mean, it's got a woman, you know, hiding and these like evil eyes looking through at her through the darkness. It makes you think that it's going to be your standard, you know, kind of film where the plumber turns out to be a psycho and tries to kill her. But, you know, that's not the route this film takes. It's um, more like he's just playing like psychological games with her. He doesn't even really want to kill her or anything. He's just, um, you know, they have like a clash, personality clash. And it just kind of escalates out of hand. And um, <clears throat> basically the the ending to me is the perfect capper for this movie because it ends so anticlimactic, but it works perfectly. I mean, I, I love the way the movie ends. Mm. So I'd recommend it. Yeah, excellent. Well, it's kind it. of like uh, it's kind of like a chess game. You're watching a human chess game, I think. Yeah, because they each try to one up each other throughout the whole movie. Battle of the minds, as it were. It's kind of the anti-Halloween, isn't it? In some ways, because it is kind of a, the psycho killer stalking a woman, but in a completely uh, different way to what you would expect. And actually, um, I did find a trailer. So if you want to, here's a trailer for 1979's The Plumber. Plumber, love. Oh, you must have the wrong unit. Well, you're 15 C. Yes, but uh, we didn't call a plumber. <laughs> Only way to get at him. Uh, there's a plumber here. He said he had to look at our pipes. I didn't call a plumber. Some of the pipes have to be replaced. Well, how long will that take? Oh, four or five hours. Can't do it today. Tomorrow, OK? Yeah! Short. Is, it, is it something that, uh, I mean, is a minute? Well, I'm not sure he's a real plumber. He said his name was Max, that he works for the university. You better take a look at the bathroom. <laughs> What's all this? I'm not really a plumber, you know. I'm actually a folk singer. A folk singer? What's funny about that? Stop it! You're obsessed about this bloody plumber. You don't believe me. You are amazing, you know? Trying to dob me in. I know what you're doing. Well, that's good, because I don't know what you're doing. I'm going to get you out of my flat. Your flat? That mad plumber, if only you'd met him. But I did, this morning in the car park. We had quite a chat. But you didn't tell me. He's a bit of a freak. My heart cat burglar. I used to go in through the bathroom window and I always carried my tools with me. So if anyone surprised me, I could tell him I was a plumber. Don't you know, don't you know that I'm me, babe? So don't you, don't you turn your back on me, cause I, I've been to Babylon and I I've seen the Mercury wings flying high. I've touched the golden fleece, cause I'm me, babe. Can't you see? Can't you see that I'm me, babe? Mm, 
Well, it doesn't actually give that much away, that trailer, but uh, that was the trailer for Peter Weir's um, The Plumber, who is Peter Weir's kind of a famous Australian director. He did um, The Last Wave with David and Chamberlain, which is um, which is really good, and Picnic on the Hanging Rock, and also... Oh, great movie. That's a great movie, isn't it? Kind of sounds like a trailer yes. to a folk song. Yes, it does, doesn't it? It's like they were advertising a folk song. Well, it's strange, well what's it? funny about that uh, trailer is, you know, the scene with the folk song is the scene where, you know, that they have like a little, you know, kind of argument banter back and forth. And he like storms off to the bathroom and all of a sudden she's standing there and she hears him singing and she opens the door and he's just singing like with this guitar and her harmonica just staring at her when he's supposed to be fixing the, the pipe. So it's I don't know. It's a really weird scene in the movie. Hmm. I think we've all had plumbers like that, haven't we? Or maybe it's just me. <laughs> But um, have you seen? I've Eric? never had to deal with a plumber, actually. Haven't you? Ever? No. What, you, you always saw, you sort out your own water. I keep, my, pi- I keep my pipes clean. Um, <laughs> oh, that's a, what a lovely mental image that is. So, <laughs> um, Eric, have you seen it? I haven't. No, I have seen. I do love um, Picnic at Hanging Rock, though. Mm. Uh, I think it's fantastic. Uh, so I, I'd never even heard of the plumber, shamefully. Oh, you should check so, it out. Yeah, so I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to purchase it. Okay. Tonight. Excellent. Oh, okay. Is there mm. anywhere still open on a Sunday <laughs> afternoon? But anyway, but yeah, it's 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 um it's an interesting um counter point point of view, I kind of guess, to to Halloween. And I think when it, my understanding is actually when it came out originally, um, it came out a year after Halloween, and uh, critics were comparing it to Halloween. But if you thought you were getting another Halloween or a Halloween clone. Um, you'd be very sorely disappointed. But if you've got patience for it, I think it's quite short as well. It's only something like 70 minutes, isn't it? It's a very short film. Um, but, yeah, that, that's great. And thank you, Nathan. Anything else that you wanted to say about it? Uh, no. OK. All right, excellent. Well, how about you, Eric? What have you been watching? OK, well, after last week's um, Ballyhoo about uh, my Super Psycho Sweet 16, I just had to check it out. Mm. So I was, I was watching that. And as you said, it was really pretty darn good, particularly because it's a recent slasher and, you know, good ones of that genre are, you know, quite rare. And the fact that it's produced by MTV, which I think is a television channel that was pulled straight from Satan's bum, um, was really <laughs> surpri- it was really surprising that something this good came from that stable. Uh, and it's, I mean, it, it's, it's worth it alone, even if the rest of it was rubbish. The, the sushi cake scene was unbelievable. I, I could watch that scene over and over and loop. We told you, didn't we? Like, we we knew did. like it. We knew you'd mm. like it, so I mean, it's good. it kind of merges um, high school movie, high school comedies, mm. but not bawdy ones with a slasher movie quite well. I thought, mm. and it's love, it's really really nice and short as well. Yes, Seven, 70 minutes or so, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Excellent. I also saw the Justin Tacular releases of the Funhouse and Slaughter High that Arrow have released. Um, they're not new releases by the time this podcast is going out, but they are new releases this week, uh, and they're fantastic, I have to say. Really, really good. And what really surprised me was that I actually think I prefer Slaughter High now to The Fun House. Oh, really? <gasps> yeah. Whoa. Is that shocking? Whoa. Well, Whoa. What, what's your thoughts on that? I mean, I think Whoa. the it's the it's the inherent silliness of, of Slaughter High makes it far more rewatchable, I think, than The Fun House. I mean, as much as I like The Fun House, I just found myself just gripped <laughs> by Slaughter High. I mean, it was only the second time I've seen the film when I uh, got the DVD in the post the other day. So hmm. uh, it I was really surprised by how much I enjoyed it on second viewing. And I do think Slaughter it's... Slaughter uh, High is a... <laughs> it's a riot. Slaughter High is a real, it's a real chore for me to sit through. Whereas The Fun House, I, I love The Fun House. I think it's very underrated. Mm. No, I do, I do I like The Fun House. Both. Yeah. The Fun House looks, like, spectacular, hmm. I have to say. When you see... Like, I've, for years, I'd only ever seen a pan and scan version of VHS. When I finally got to see it in widescreen, it really... Um, uh, it, it is something special, I think. But... In terms of rewatchability, I think Slaughter High is, is more. I'm sorry you feel that way, Joseph. <laughs> it's, it's, well, uh, I, I will eventually give it another chance. I mean, it's been a few years, but the one thing I always seem to remember is that uh, uh, Carolyn Monroe, that's her name, right? Yeah. And she's playing like a 17 or 25-year-old, and she's literally, I mean, she's like pushing 40 when she made the film. <laughs> it's like the oldest cast of teenagers I've ever seen in my life. All part of its charm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, did you did you get any? That's not the only it? charm it has, I think. <laughs> but I'll give it another chance. I think you should. I think you should. Um, <laughs> did you have a listen to the commentary track? I did. I had listened to both of your commentaries. 
Yeah, I just wondered. I'm not. I just. It's just people have said the um, the interview on Slaughter High that Mark Ezra, the director, it seems um, to get quite narky. I yeah, I read. I read that as well, and I didn't pick that up at all on, on the commentary. I have to say. No, because I. He seemed. To, he was very um, dryly humorous, mm. uh, and I sometimes that probably doesn't come across when you can't see someone's face or if they're yeah. smiling or laughing. But I don't remember him being. Um, I mean, he does make some rather strange claims, but I think he was. He was probably joking when he thought. He was being. He said he thought he's being highly original, um, but uh, but yeah, I've got the trailer here for Slaughter High. Shall we? Um, shall we do this? Even Joseph, yeah, play, you can it, put play your it twice just for Joseph. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> so Marty Ranson was the dork of Doddsville High. You get undressed in there. His classmates laughed at him. Are you ready? Here's Marty. Where's the beast? They tormented him. Where's the beast? <laughs> and then they went too far. <laughs> now, five years later, Marty's throwing a little party. A class reunion. Come on, you guys, let's party. They say he still roams the nut house ever hopeful of that chance to escape so we can take his evil revenge out on us all. And he's making sure everyone has the time of their life. I feel sick. He's created a romantic atmosphere for rekindling old flames. And a nice place to just hang around. Marty hasn't forgotten a thing. He's giving them a blast from the past they'll never forget. Marty Ranson is still a dork, but tonight he's getting even. Vestron Pictures presents Slaughter High. Joey, Joey, dirty oh, there you go. I, do, I love that. Even the trailer, even the trailer is terrible. I mean, the guy, the, the narrator, so upbeat. Marty's getting revenge. See you there. Yeah. <laughs> I love the um, the Harry Manfredini music, that real cheesy. Wah, 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 wah. Yeah, that's no, great, isn't it? It's fantastic. How about um, you, Nathan? Okay. You're being very quiet. What's um, your views on Slaughter High? Um, I think I love Slaughter High. I mean, I, I adore it. And um, one interesting thing to me about Slaughter High is there are no sympathetic characters in that entire movie. I don't even think Marty's sympathetic. I mean, mm. he's a big dork. He kind of deserves to get picked on. He don't deserve to get burned alive, but he does kind of deserve to get – because he's so – He's so weird. But, I mean, the, the people picking on him are unlikable, too, so they kind of deserve what they get, too. So it's just a bunch of unlikable people killing each other off, I say. Yeah, well, fair enough. The, the, the print enough. on the Arrow DVD <laughs> seems to be under the title uh, April Fool's Day. Is that right, Justin? Yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah. Which, um, which, again, I think we spoke about this before, didn't we, saying that if – I think – it was because they sold the the rights mm. to April Fool's Day to Paramount for a huge amount of money. Apparently, I don't know how much, but apparently it's quite a lot of money. Uh, and but it it was um, it was all set to go out, and so obviously the whole April Fool's Day thing didn't quite work without the title. Uh, but yeah, I mean that was that was the thing. But I'm but it must it must them. have been released somewhere as April Fool's Day, was it? If it if it has that title card on the DVD. Yeah, I don't know unless it's um, an original kind of print because um, mm-hmm. uh, it would have been shown at Cannes with possibly with that title oh, before right, it got yeah. distribution. Maybe I I don't know, but uh, yeah, you quite often see that, don't you? With some films, um, they've got a completely different title uh, from what's on the DVD case, and I suppose it's whatever's the best print available. I kind of guess, yeah. but. Yeah. Um, but yeah, okay. Well, no, th- thanks. For that. I'm sure we'll come back and um, I think we played the Thunhouse trailer um, a little while back, so uh, I won't um, do that. Yes, uh, I had listened. Your commentary on the Funhouse was uh, quite fun as well with Callum Waddle. Yeah, yeah. And uh, he, 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 you mentioned at one stage Tobe Hooper's later film um, Life Force, yeah. which is one I also saw during the week. It was on one of the movie channels, and okay. uh, there's some choice words that Callum has to say about that film. Mm. <laughs> Mm. Yes. I quite I enjoy um, Life Force. I mean, so do I. I think it's really, really He doesn't fun. like it. He doesn't like Life Force. No, he. I think he does like it, but he just says, "What were they thinking? What were they smoking? What were they ingesting when they came up with the script?" And when you know, I think Life Force is fun. Mm. It, is. it is great fun, but it is it is bonkers. 
Yeah, it fairness. is kind yeah. of crazy. I mean, yeah. I mean, when you th- you compare something like a Michael Bay Transformers movie um, as a big summer blockbuster with Toby Hooper's Life Force uh, for Canon Films, and you you can't imagine how they 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 did that. I mean, Canon Films pumped so much money into Toby Hooper of, after Poltergeist, wasn't it, with, um, uh, what was it, um, Invaders from Invaders Mars. Invaders from Mars. And what was the other one? There was a three-deal. Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, which is obviously kind of still, it's quite a high-budget film, isn't it, when you look at Texas Chainsaw Massacre 2. It's obviously got quite a lot of money there on, on the screen. Um, mm. But with Life Force, I mean, I don't know what the budget was on that. It must have been pretty substantial. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, sort of bonkers, bonkers. But he's, I think Toby Hooper's just written a novel, isn't he, apparently? Um, but I must admit, I don't have any great interest in checking that out. But uh, No, me neither. But, no, so um, I, I'm not, uh, I mean, I know, Nathan, you said like last week that Texas Chainsaw Massacre was your favourite ever film or that you, what you consider was the best slasher film and the best film of all time. So obviously Toby must be quite high up there but do you do you think he's had a good career or you well i will say that his like recent stuff i'm not you know too happy about but now Hmm. like i love eating alive and the fun house and texas chainsaw and even texas chainsaw 2 you know I, i love all his older movies yeah cool excellent well you got anything else to say about it eric no, no, not this. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, I just uh, just a couple of films I've watched um, recently. Talking about um, Super Psycho Sweet Sixteen, I watched the trailer. Um, sorry, the trailer. I watched the, the sequel uh, to that film uh, earlier in the week. And off the bat, I'm not going to get spoil anything, but it's not as much fun as the first film. But it's still worth a watch, and uh, many, many times better than a lot of the kind of crap slashes that we've been have been sort of forced upon us in the last um, sort of five, ten years. Uh, it's got some great moments in it. It hasn't got anything that quite rivals the sushi cake, although it does have a scene, a really good scene, with somebody dying inside a stripper cake. Um, do you know, like those those cakes yes. where they have to jump out. Um, that's really good. And there's another really good scene where uh, a girl gets some kind of power tool through the back of her head, and you see her from the front, and it kind of emerges through a forehead, which was kind of really well done. Uh, the the problem with the, the sequel actually is, unfortunately, it spends a little bit too much time on the kind of teenage relationships and not enough time on killing teenagers, which, you know, if we weren't talking about slash movies, we probably would be arrested for that kind of sentiment. But the fact we are is it's it's just it's not as much fun as the first film. But then most sequels aren't as good unless they happen to be um, Friday 13th Part 2, which may, you know, is better than the first film. Uh, but it's definitely worth seeing. And I think there's going to be a Part 3 as well. Have Have any of you seen the sequel to it? Not yet, no. no. No, it's on my list. I'm going yeah. to check it out this week. Okay, yeah, it's definitely worth definitely worth a view. Um, so that that was that. Um, another film um, that I saw, which is kind of kind of a, I kind of gonna guess a semi slasher movie. Um, it's another new one, um, and that is Husk. It's um, have you any of you guys seen it? No, not yet. I no. want to. Uh, okay. It's um it's it's okay. I mean, basically, uh, what it is 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 a kind of entry into the killer scarecrow, uh, sort of sub sub genre. Uh, it's it's not silly in so much it's not doesn't play it for laughs at all. So it's quite creepy, um, but it's not. Uh, the reason I was thinking about it actually is when you were talking about Scream Time, Joseph, and how that um, the, the episode, the slasher episode in Scream Time, works so well, but in the confines of a say twenty five minutes, half an hour. But when they stretch it over into a whole movie, which they did for Psychosis, they had to you know pad, literally pad it out by putting in you know bum sex and stuff, and you know all this kind of stuff. It didn't really, <laughs> it didn't really work. Whereas w- with this, it's another classic example actually of a film which would work much better as a short story it, there's just not enough story there to sustain 90 minutes or however long it was it's still worth a watch it's kind of atmospheric and it's difficult not to be atmospheric with a killer scarecrow 
and a bunch of um, teenagers, twenty somethings in you know cornfields and like creepy old houses and stuff. But it's you know it's it's a mixture. What what's actually um, uh, is of interest? It's actually got one of the actors, which was um, C J Thomason, who was in Harper's Harper's Island. Um, and he plays one of the characters in this. Uh, so it's worth a watch. It's one of those films that you put on, you know, while you're having your dinner or something, but it's not something that I would necessarily rec- recommend, but I've seen a lot, a lot worse. So, so yeah, that's um, I've seen a few other things, but I think we've already talked quite a lot about recently seen. So uh, unless there's anything else you want to talk about, guys, we can move on to the next thing. Mm-hmm. Very well, yes. Nate. Okay. That would be well, Nathan's uh, worst slasher to catch yes. up. Yes, Nathan, do you want to um, enlighten us? What has been pissing you off this week? Well, it, well, I don't know if it necessarily pisses me off just this week. It mostly does of all time. Okay. And my <laughs> worst slasher now kind of uh, is a combination of two films, uh, Rob Zombie's Halloween 1 and 2, which Ooh. I think are both complete rubbish. Mm. And I don't even know if anything – I don't even know if I could say anything that hasn't already been said about them. They took a fantastic movie, and they, he shit all over it. And no offense to Rob Zombie. I've heard he's a really nice guy. But as far as the movie goes, I feel like it's a disgrace to the original Halloween 1 and 2. Amen. Amen. Mm, Amen yes. to that, brother. Um, am, I, or am I in agreement with my fellow podcast co-host, or did any of y'all prefer the remake? Oh, oh, I do not mm. prefer the remake. <laughs> no, I don't think any See, of it. Here's the question. Which one do you think is worse, the first one or the second one? I think, I think Halloween Two is worse than One. Do I you? thought One was worse than Two. I thought One. I was thought One worse was worse. Yeah. yeah. I thought bits of Two were okay. You know, because it went so kind of. <gasps> um, well, well, I got yeah. a confession to make though, and that is, I love Halloween, but I kind of prefer the sequel a little more for entertainment value, the originals. Mm. So I, I kind of hate that Part Two was, you know, also completely butchered in the remake. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I liked in part two because um, I I put off watching it for ages and ages because I hated the first one, um, and I think I said this before, but I was actually in Los Angeles in Hollywood wh- where there was the um, premiere for Rob Zombie's Halloween in two thousand and seven. And um, it had massive posters up all around Hollywood, and it was at a Chinese theatre, and we just stayed around the back, around the back of there. And I thought, oh, should we see if we can get in? Because I, you know, I didn't know anything about. Well, I knew about it, but I didn't know how bad it was going to be. Um, and we tried to see if we could get in to see it, and we couldn't. But thankfully, that was the case. But we kind of watched <laughs> all the stars turning up to watch it and everything. And um, but we did stick around to see their kind of sour faces as when they came out. So. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and they did that whole thing, you know, that we talk about in almost every podcast about new movies where Laurie Strode in the Halloween remakes is so unlikable. I didn't care if he killed her or not. Whereas, you know, oh, you I did care. Jamie I, Lee Curtis. To, I wanted him to kill her. Well, really yeah, I mean, I've been fine her. with it. <laughs> yeah. But it's just Jamie Lee Curtis. You root for her. I mean, she's awesome. She's vulnerable. You know, she's strong when she needs to be in the original Halloween movies. But this Laurie Strode, I was like, oh, I don't care what happens to you. I mean, he can just like. Stab you through the throat. I'll be fine with it. Mm. In the and movie, early language as well. There's too much bad language. It made not just baby Jesus, but Mary and Joseph all cried when they heard the language. I yes, I cried. Yeah. See, I have a foul mouth, but even that was too much for me. It's always "fuck you, cunt," this or "eat my tube steak," this or. <laughs> <laughs> I may have to bleep some of this out, Joseph, but um, yeah, we'll no. just see. But well, it's yeah, like the movie gutter are... balls. It, 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 it's Cuddable. like every sentence has to have some kind of cuss word in it. And after a while, you're like, okay, it's enough. I'm not a, you know, I don't care. I mean, it, cussing doesn't usually bother me, but I mean, there's a, such a thing as too much of it. I know. I wasn't, I wasn't a huge fun of gutter balls either because I don't, I hate when, it. It when people say they are, they, they're remaking slasher movies like they used to be. And then they make something like gutter balls or the Halloween remake. And you're thinking slasher movies weren't like this. You know, when was Jamie Lee Curtis dropping the F-bomb or, I mean, I've got nothing against swearing. I've got no problem, you know, with, well, we know that. Cut. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you say know. a lot, Joseph. Yeah. Justin. Do I say cunt, hey, cunt a lot? Hey. I don't. You do occasionally. The c yes. word. But I don't. I don't. You know, the old films. People would swear in them sometimes, but it would be once or twice in the movie. It wasn't every other okay. word, and it just becomes 
tiresome, doesn't it? Because mm. you've got obnoxious people swearing throughout the whole movie, and you want them all dead. There's no no real fun to that. And I found I found um, Gutterballs pretty much of a chore as much as I found the Halloween 2007 um, film a complete chore to sit around sit through. Um, so you know, but then you can go the other route and have something as obnoxious in because it's so boring and dull and barely there like the prom night remake so you know that's why my super psycho sweet 16 works so well because it captures the the fun of the slasher movie uh you know captures that it's got like a genie in the bottle it actually gets it right where a lot of people who profess to be fans of the genre just don't get it right when they make films um and rob zombie is the perfect um example of that so yeah, well, thank you, Nathan. Um, I'm sure we're going to come back to um, you know the shit sandwich that is the Halloween sequels. But um, also, have you heard anything about the Halloween three? Because there is that's still supposed to be kind of floating around, isn't it? So I've heard 3D. of it. I'll watch it. I mean, I'm, mm. I'm a glutton for punishment. It's not. It's not Rob Zombie this time, though, is it? No, it's, no. it's 3D, and it's written by. I heard it's written by the guys who did the My Bloody Valentine remake, but that might have changed. Yeah. Because yeah. I thought at one point, I might be wrong in this, but at one point, I think the people who um, who were behind Inside, the French slasher movie, were in talks to direct it, which would have been really interesting. Mm. Um, oh, that would have been great, Inside's actually. Inside's really good. Yeah. But yeah, then very- Halloween films have never been about the gore, have they? But um, whereas Inside is, is very, very gory. But I would. It'd be interesting to see somebody like that trying um, take it back to its roots and actually make it scary again. But I also heard they were going to be following on from the Rob Zombie timeline and the same characters, which would mean they would probably feel like they had to play lip service to what Rob Zombie did, which means we probably would get more skull fuck this and skull fuck that. But I don't know. <laughs> And a very mean Lori. I don't like yeah. Lori being mean. I, I think she needs to be nice. Yeah. Exactly. And sweet. Yeah. I think they just, the whole Rob Zombie crew should just fucking fuck off. If, fucking if that's how off. you feel, Joseph, <laughs> then how come when we're going to this new horror convention, you said you wanted to meet the uh, kid that was in uh, the Halloween remake? Oh, I, I just said, uh, I didn't say that, but if I do. Yes, you meet, did. I did not. You're lying. <laughs> if I do meet him, it should be to. Uh, you know, send him up to some pedophile's uh, hotel room. That is horrible. <laughs> He's just an actor. He didn't make the movie. And also, well, also, he must be about 18 now, so yeah. I, I doubt That's any true. pedophile will be particularly interested in him now. So, But anyway, we that um, on that bombshell, thank you, Joseph, for bringing <laughs> the podcast down even further than we thought we could prob- <laughs> probably do. So we've reached a new low. We have reached the yes. new low. So I need. Well, wait, I need wait some... to hear when Justin comes back from his holidays. All the stories he has about the various shops and in inverted commas he's been in. <laughs> mm. Yes. Well, I won't be doing anything like that. I'm going to um, ca- um, California. I don't know, think they have those kind of supermarkets there. I don't know. <laughs> oh, I oh, very... West Hollywood. How about West Hollywood? <laughs> I hear it's very Are you going clean. To San Francisco. So, am I going to San Francisco? Yes, I am. Yeah. Oh, because you need to do the face. San Francisco, here I come. Oh, exactly. yeah. I shall put that you need on to my do that. headphones. Well, I'm really hoping that um, Peaches... Have you heard of Peaches Christ? Yes. Yeah, it's kind of a drag uh-huh. queen, but she does uh, uh, things in the Castro in San Francisco, and they do things like they do um, sleepaway camp nights, and they show sleepaway camp, and they reenact um, scenes from the movie, uh, and it sounds like really good fun. So I'm hoping something like that will be happening in San Francisco while I'm there. So um, yes, well, anyway, enough of my holiday. Um, back to what we're talking about. So have you have you got it off your chest now, Nathan? Well, I'm, I'll never fully get off my no. chest because it's burned into my memory. I can't erase that. Mm. But um, but we shall leave Rob Zombie in the uh, well gutter. The, the gutter, yes, exactly. Not looking yes. at the stars, um, but we'll leave him in the gutter. Uh, and we'll um, shall we move on to feedback? Because I think um, Eric, have you got a little something for us? I've got a little something for it. We don't have any feedback this week, but here's a little no. jingle I made. That's uh, Robosh Tacular. Uh, using my iPhone, that'll give you the email address if you want to send us some mail.
And so it goes on and on. That was actually recorded using the actual robots from Chopping Mall. Was it? Yeah. Yeah, we got we got them. Uh, we got we, them on the show. I didn't get a chance to interview them. They were kind of busy doing Short Circuit 3, but uh, they recorded that a little bit for me. Uh, isn't that wonderful? Yeah. Yeah, the Short Circuit 3 remake is uh, directed by Rob Zombie, by the way. <laughs> I can't wait to see oh, that. Like to see That's that, going to be yeah. great. So. Number five is fucking alive, you fucking cunt. <gasps> Eric. <laughs> I know. Speaking of cursing. Yeah, holy Ooh. Mary, Jesus and Joseph. Well, that's what, that's what Rob Zombie's short circuit would sound like. Go and yes. wipe your tongue on the Blarney stone. The baby Jesus crowns on you, Eric. The Blarney Johnny stone's about 200 miles away. Johnny is fucking alive. <laughs> oh, dear. Johnny no Five Steve would be a redneck. Hmm? Sorry? No Steve Gutenberg in this one. No. Oh, Unless, well, he, he might get reinvented because Rob, Rob Zombie always seems to get people from older films, doesn't he? And, and then gives them thankless um, cameos. But thank you, Eric. But um, Actually, Joseph. Actually, um, if you couldn't understand the robots, our email is uh, v.hysteria.continues at gmail.com. And we have no feedback this week, so uh, we blame everyone. Yeah. Send us feedback or die. Exactly. To keep it in, keeping it in tone. Come on, you bunch of cunts. Right in. Okay. <laughs> and also, on that, um, sorry? you set up a Facebook group as well, oh, Joseph, yes. haven't you? Yes, we, we're now on Facebook. Uh, that is <laughs> facebook.com forward slash the hysteria continues. That's exactly. all one word. Okay. Or you could just and search it does that. continue. Yeah. It does continue. Yes, it does continue. Are we so uh, look us up, like us, comment. Uh, yeah, have fun with it. Great. Okay. And as well, far as I know, one more thing, we may be on Twitter very soon, so okay. keep an eye out for that. Brilliant. Okay. Yes. Yep. Um, well, moving swiftly on, um, and we will be a swearing-free zone, um, perhaps. Um, after for the this, time being. For the time being. But we are moving now on to our feature presentation, so which is 1986's chopping mall and what we're going to do first is listen to the trailer and then eric is going to talk us through the um jim winorski's slasher robot mashup here we go they broke into the mall for the wildest all-night party of their lives at that meet but you're never alone in the chopping mall that robot shopping mall where shopping costs you an arm and a leg Okay, that's the uh, trailer for 1986's Chopping Mall. So my uh, analysis of the film's plot is going to be quite in-depth, so please bear with me. Chopping Mall is, like, totally about teenagers chased by killer robots and stuff. So, Justin, what do you think? <laughs> oh. No, oh, seriously, no, seriously. I have, a, I have a, a, a more substantial plot synopsis here. Okay. I just thought that it kind of explains itself in one sentence if you wanted to. But mm. uh, Chopping Mall is set in this everyday run-of-the-mill shopping centre that has secu- a security setup that is far from run-of-the-mill. It's got three high-tech robots equipped with various sort of high-tech weaponry. Uh, and these robots are harmless to the average Joe Soap, the average law-abiding Joe, Joe Soap, that is, until the mall is hit by lightning. And this brings us back to our reference to Short Circuit earlier. Uh, this causes them to not come to life, but to malfunction in such a manner that you'll be convinced that they're running on Windows Vista. Uh, Now, eight youngsters have decided to choose this of all days to hide out in a furniture store within the shopping mall, uh, you know, for a night of canoodling and watching Attack of the Crab Monsters. But their fun soon comes to an end when the now killer robots come a-calling, leading to death, destruction, and one incredible exploding head that is even superior to the famous one from Scanners, in my opinion. Um, Chopping Mall is possibly the least pretentious film that you're ever likely to see. I mean, as I said in the sort of jokey introduction, it is literally teenagers being chased by killer robots. um, And it doesn't pretend to be anything else other than that. And it's got it's a lean 75 minutes. Uh, So that's why I love it. It's, it's, It's lean, it's low in exposition and it cuts to the robotic mayhem as, you know, as soon as possible. There is a streak of humor running through it. And if you know me well at all. 
I have a problem sometimes with horror comedies, but I think it works perfectly in this instance because the cast are playing it all with a straight face and they let the ludicrous nature of the plot provide the fun. Um, and it's nicely, you know, devoid of those intrusive quips that you get in films like we were discussing in a few podcasts ago on Scream 4, for example, where somebody says something clever and witty as they're being pulverised with a knife or an axe or something. Uh, thankfully, that's not here. I mean, Kelly Maroney says, you know, a couple of Schwarzenegger-like one-liners at certain stages in the film. But, I mean, that's as far as it goes. Um, you know, that's why horror comedies work best for me. It's It's when... The comedy comes from the fact that, oh, you know, there's a killer robot chasing this woman and it's blasting lasers at her arse as she's running down, screaming. Uh, you know, it doesn't it doesn't need to have her slipping on a banana skin or saying something stupid as she's about to die. Um, you know, and the film benefits also from a terrific location, you know, much like the initiation and Dawn of the Dead, which made great use of the shopping mall locations. And if I can voice a controversial opinion here, once again, we should probably have an alarm for these. Uh when it comes to shopping mall horror, I actually prefer shopping mall to Dawn of the Dead. Is that too much to say? Ooh. Ooh. <laughs> um, well, well, the problem I have with Dawn of the Dead is like, I, ha- I hate all the characters in it. I find them, for, well, I don't hate them. I just find them very cold. Um, and the characters in Chopping Mall, you know, they're relatively likable. I mean, as you say, Justin, as we've said many times, um, but you say it on the, the um, commentary to Slaughter High, you know, there isn't a huge amount of depth to characters in slasher movies. You know, it, it isn't a Woody Allen film. But, uh, you know, what what information we are given is they are quite likable. You have Alison and Susie, the best friends. You have the nerdy character, uh, Ferdy. And, you know, he has these hidden technical skills and he, you know, he steps up to it when he needs to be brave and help uh, Alison from the killer robots. You have the macho heroic one, Rick. You have Mike, who's the square jawed sort of funny one who's chewing gum all the time. I mean, they're cliched characters but fun to watch and easy to root for and that's probably why you know i find it more fun watching this film than dawn of the dead i find dawn of the dead a bit over long as well but i mean i'm possibly the only person who who shares that i know everyone considers it a classic i uh, of you know I've, i don't want to talk about dawn of the dead all the time but of that uh, uh those romero uh, zombie films i think day of the dead would be my favorite um so that's my thoughts on uh Chopping Mall. I think it's a it's a bona fide exploitation movie. It's got boobs and bums and exploding heads and killer robots and you know lasers shooting people on the arse. What more could you want from a film, uh, Nathan? What more could you want from a film? Oh, there's not much more that I can want from a film. I love uh, Chopping Mall very much. Um, uh, I, I like the idea that you know they could have just went the regular slasher route, like a mad killer stalking them in the mall, which you know I would have loved probably just as much. But I kind of like the idea that they went for killer robots chasing them. Obviously, the head explosion scene is a standout, and I like the ensuing scene with like all the mayhem when you know the robots turn on the group that's watched their friend get her head blown off, and like as they like clumsily try to get away from them. I mean, like one guy just slips and falls, you know, flat on a table. I mean, I thought that was kind of realistic, you know, in the pretty unrealistic movie, but I mean, I would imagine if you're trying to get away like that, you'd be all clumsy and stuff too. Um, and let's see what else. I love the scene where the doors are all closing and you see the robot silhouette and he's like clicking his little pot hand together. Mm-hmm. I thought that was kind of a fun scene. Um, I do get very upset with, uh, I mean, I love Barbara Crampton, you know, you're, you're amazing, Barbara, and I love you in Bold and the Beautiful, uh, but I, her character drives me crazy when she, they're, they're safe, and she goes back down to the mall. I'm like, what are you doing? But um, it's, a, it's, it's a great movie, um, and I thought, you know, like, uh, for a pretty low-budget movie, they got some really good actors in it. The only thing that really bothered me, like, towards the end is, uh, did, uh, you guys remember, like, um, uh, Allison and Ferdy uh, separate at one point because they're trying mm. to find, I think it's the control room. And Ferdy takes the gun and Allison goes off with nothing. I'm like, <laughs> that always annoyed me. I'm like, you know, why don't you give her the gun? I mean, <laughs> you know, she's just kind of walking off with nothing. And she's injured, too. Mm. But, you know, I mean, it, it's still a really fun movie. And... Uh, being pretty short, it never outstays its welcome. Yeah, I, I would agree. I think poor old uh, Kelly Maroney, I think she suffers the the most gruesome of fates. And, well, not fates, but when she has to hide under that desk with all the creepy crawlies. That to me oh, is yeah. the most horrific element of, of Chopping Mall, I have to say. 
I think I'd rather be be zapped on the arse by a killer robot than have a tarantula <laughs> crawling up my arm. <laughs> I've got I've got uh, plenty of arse anyway. I think it'll probably just deflect off it. Um, Joseph, what do you think of chopping? Oh, mall? I love chop. I love chopping mall. Uh, the one fundamental question that I always get from chopping mall is why would a uh, shopping mall need laser equipped robots? I mean, wouldn't you think that they would be more apt on a military base, like guarding us from uh, insurgents or something like that, and instead of you know stalking, you know stragglers or shoplifters in a shopping mall but i guess you if you didn't have them there wouldn't be a film but uh no uh i like chopping mall it's it's really cheesy it's it's really it's breezy i mean it it doesn't overstay its welcome like nathan said i mean it's it's over in a blink of an eye uh kelly maroney she's like a really plucky final girl i really liked her and i really liked the opening scene with uh paul vartell and mary warnoff kind of referencing their characters from eating Raoul and they're making snide snarky remarks about the robots and um of course you have the exploding head and you have cameo from uh, dick miller and he actually gets electrocuted but the thing about chopping mall is that like i said it's it's never boring i mean there's always something going on uh there's never there's never a slow spot uh if there is like a slow spot, it's basically kind of giving, you know, the characters a little room to talk and the characters are so likable that you don't really, you know, find yourself looking at your watch or at the clock on the wall. It's just, it's, it's a real fun movie. It's a mashup of uh, science fiction and slasher film theatrics. And it's one I really recommend. Mm. Yeah. It's probably one that we have, uh, cause we have this ability to shoehorn any film we want into, into the sort of slasher subgenre to suit ourselves and this is this is probably an instance of that i mean it is you know has tenuous links but i mean it is a, a, if you replace the robots with men with with knives you'd probably have a slasher movie i'm sure justin oh absolutely what are you, yeah justin what are your thoughts on chopping mall good yeah. or bad i mean i know i've read the hysteria lives review and i know that's quite old and it wasn't that positive yeah, I've, I have still have mixed feelings about it. I I watched it this afternoon and I you know really enjoyed it for for what it is. I think again probably when I first um, uh, watched the film and wrote the review, I think I was probably a little bit disappointed. It wasn't as much of a slash movie as as I was expecting. And my understanding, um, having listened to some of the extra features on the DVD, is that uh, uh, Julie Corman, who is she. The wife or the daughter? She's the wife of Roger Corman, yeah. Okay. And she asked Jim Wynorski to basically come up with a story about kids in the mall being chased by a killer, um, either because she's seen the initiation and wanted to rip it, rip it off, or she didn't realise there hadn't been a kind of psycho killer film um, in the mall setting. Um, but I really enjoyed it this time. I, it was kind of... it is. It is what it is. It's a it's a knowing B movie, you know. And obviously, Roger Corman is um, the king of the boo, B movies. No, just put my teeth back in. Roger Corman is the king of the B movies, and um, and it obviously references their own film um, when Kelly Maroney and Tony O'Dell are watching the Attack of the Crab Monsters or whatever it's called. Um, um, in the uh, the furniture store, but yeah, I really like it. the The characters are fun. It's the pure eightiesness of it, which is great. Um, even the slightly annoying characters are quite fun. You know, they, it's kind of it's all painted in the very broad strokes, um, and uh, you know, it didn't outstay its welcome. Um, and I, that that was really good. But I echo what Joseph said: is the whole idea of having these killer robots. Uh, sort of guarding this this kind of suburb well what suburban or whatever shopping mall which had like you know pantyhose shops and you know pet shops and stuff like that when you have paying someone to sit upstairs to watch the robots rather than just paying someone to be a security guard but then as you said there wouldn't be a film if they didn't do that um Talking about the the pet scene um, or the pet store scene, the thing that caught my eye today was the box that had cock starter on it. Did you see that one? Had what on it? Cock starter. Cock starter. Well, what it was is the way they they cropped it because then they panned over slightly and it was cockatiel starter kit. Um, so it was but for, for, for much. I trust you to find these hidden details. I know. For, um, for much of that scene, Sick it's got while Kelly is hiding under the under the shelf with the tarantulas crawling over. It's got this box um, 
with cock starter on it. So I did wonder what was going on with it. Anyway, you see, I always it. tend to look away if if snakes and spiders appear on the screen. I tend to look away, so that's why I missed the cock starter box. Uh, we should go back and have a look at it. Um, um, what else? I mean, I, yeah, it's it's just a lot of fun, um, and we're going to talk after the interviews a bit more about the kind of perhaps the, some of the background behind the movie and maybe some of the links it has with with other movies, um, perhaps. But yeah, I I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it was it was good fun um, film. Uh, didn't take itself seriously. Uh, had likable characters. Um, didn't wasn't didn't really have any scares as such, but. It it was, you know, it's a good fun time. So, yeah. Yeah, well, I mean, it's far from scary. I'll give you that. But it is, it's more like an 80s action movie probably than it is a horror. Mm. Would that be fair to say? Yeah. We kind it's of an echoes. amalgam of everything. Yeah. yeah. Action, kind of... horror, science fiction, slasher. It just works, I think. It really, mm. it really does work. Mm. Well, do we want to, um, because we've got four interviews to get through, um, yeah. get through, that sounds awful, four interviews, we're lucky enough um, to have four interviews with the um, the cast of um, Chopping Mall, so maybe we should go to the first one. Um, yes, Joseph, you interviewed yes, someone. Yes, uh, I interviewed the heroine, Kelly Maroney, and she was really, really lovely person, uh, Fast, bit of a fast talker, but... Uh, she has some really things to say about the film, and I don't know. Take it away. Excellent. Here's Kelly Maroney. Hey, would I set you up with a slime dog or something? No way, babe. It, it is, is babe, babe, isn't it? it? Come on, come on. Take a well. It's hot. I want it's hot. Girls, come on. Yeah, all right, all right. Waitress, more butter. How did you get uh, first involved with Chopping Mall? Um. Well. Uh, Jim Wynorski had seen me in Night of the Comet, and um, he called me in, and then um, I auditioned for it, and then I had to audition for Julie. Jim and I got along swell. I had come in, I was shooting the Zero Boys, and I had been up all night, so I was punchy. I was so tired, so I was very, very relaxed. But then when I went in to meet Julie, I clenched up because I was intimidated by her because she was giving me the fish eye. <laughs> and she had some uh, girl that she wanted for the part. And Jim was like, what's the matter with you? Relax, relax. You were so chill when you were here before. And I went, she scares me. She doesn't want me. And he goes, well, I want you. So, you know. And actually, uh, that girl was a Mormon, and she didn't want to swear in the movie, so she backed off. And I got the part. And I don't really even think, I, I can't remember swearing in that movie, but anyway, who cares? I don't believe you I got did, the part. actually. I don't believe you did. I don't think so I did either, but it's anyway. kind of ironic there, isn't it? Yeah. Well, it was, uh, there was a, um, I, I didn't go up for the babysitter in The World According to Garp because it said, you know, don't bother sending your actresses if they're not willing to do topless because the babysitter's got to be topless. And so I didn't go because I didn't want to do that. And when I saw the movie, she wasn't topless. <laughs> oh, that, that came back to bite you, didn't it? Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, what was it like working with uh, Jim Wynorski? Well, Jim and I are good friends, and I get his sense of humor. It drives him insane when people are standing around with their mouths open, not knowing what they're doing you know, not being awake, and he starts yelling, and that scares people. But he never scared me. We had a lot of laughs. We still do. Well, that's cool. Um, according to the IMDb, you did all of your own stunt work on the film. Is there any truth to this? And if there is, did you ever feel as if you were in danger doing your own stunts? I did not. Um, I did not. Do, I, well, we faked the fall. We had one stunt gal one time and she she actually took a fall there was a big huge air mattress there and they did drop me on the air mattress but when they let go of that harness that had me on the rail that was her going down in the air because they did not have me insured for that and so I let go and then cut to her falling and then they actually dropped me from a pretty from a pretty strong height and then uh, when the glass exploded, they had her standing close to the glass because, again, they didn't have me insured for that. Wow. But uh, the, rest of it, the rest of it I did. 
Oh, cool, cool. Do you have any kind of um, uh, amusing behind-the-scenes stories when the cameras weren't rolling? Well, we have tons of amusing stories. You well, you don't have our, to. Just maybe a couple you should, if you have any. You should have seen our, our catering. It was Mama Cajun, and we had never had any idea what it was. We used to call it possum patties and weasel strips. <laughs> and we we didn't even know what they were serving us. This is how bad the catering was. And, you know, we were stuck there. It was the middle of the night. It's not like you could run out and get a subway or something like that. And one time they served us for, for dessert these little dental cups with whipped cream on top of them. And so we thought, well, there's probably a little piece of cake or something under that. No, it was a little cup with cream in it. We, I mean, we just died laughing. It's like, you know, what are we going to do? Pack our own lunches from now on? So, they, they, we got rid of them. I think eventually. Um, the day we blew up Susie Slater's head was, I thought, I thought the crew was going to have an orgasm. I mean, they were so excited about that. Yeah, I was actually, I was actually going to, <laughs> I was actually going to ask you about that if you were there when they did the. Uh, so, oh, we were all there because we had to be standing there when the blood splattered all over the window. So we were all watching it. Right. I mean, and we were all kind of stuck in that store watching it. And poor Susie, you know, they had her all rigged up because, um, you know, she had to be directed remotely. So they had something in her ear, and Jim would yell, "Susie!" She would go, "No." <laughs> Oh God! Were you there when they actually did the 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 actual explosion on the um, the prosthetic? I was there for all of it. Oh wow, wow! Uh, when was the last uh, time? One you... thing I was not there for was when Mary Warnoff and and Peter, I mean, and, and Paul Bart, um, um, Peter, Paul Bart, shot their scene, and I'd worked with Mary before, but they shot it before my call time. You know that whole thing in the beginning when the Right, where they're giving you the, the, the eating Raul people. And, uh, well, the, the idea was that the eating Raul people had a restaurant in the mall. Oh yeah, always, yeah, that was that was the gag. I always but, loved that little cameo, actually. Yeah. Um, but uh, when was the last time you saw the film? I mean, did you enjoy it, or was it just a job to you? Um, oh, I do enjoy it, and you know, I think the soundtrack makes makes the movie. And when they play Allison's theme song, when the robot's chasing me, da 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 da. And then mine is da 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 da. da. So, they, and they they start juxtaposing those. I find that very moving. I mean, yeah, I get tears in my eyes. We had a screening of it at the New Beverly last year, and Jim and I were there. And I must admit, you know, no, I mean, any any time I shoot something, I am forever emotionally involved with it. Excellent. I hate watching myself, but once I get over that. Wow, because yeah. you know, a lot of people will, will do these as just, you know, a paycheck. It's kind of yeah. good to hear that you have some kind of uh, a bond after you've filmed a movie like that. I can I can never phone something, and it's too important to me. You you put something on film, it's there forever. Exactly. And I take this I take this as a calling. I don't take this as a job. Wow. I would never, ever walk through anything. You, you, you know, you might not like the way I did it, but I'm not walking through it. Fantastic. Um, I, I don't want to take up too much more of your time, so uh, do you have any kind of last words to all the fans out there? Just thank you so much for all the support. You have no idea what it means when, because this is a tough business, and there's a lot of rejection, and there's a lot of disappointment. But I'll tell you what, once, you know, once you're working on something and you're pouring your heart into it, um, it you forget all that stuff. But then when the fans come around and they tell you, you know, like decades later that something meant something to them, you don't know what that does for an actor. It just makes them feel like, you know, like my life wasn't a waste of time. And it means the world to us. And just thank you very much. Wow, that's that's fantastic. Um, I want to say uh, I really, really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to do this. You bet. And thank you, Kelly. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Have a great day. You or too. night. Okay. Bye-bye. So, what do you say? You say go out and have a good time. Oh, all right. That is bitching. 
Boy, I wish I had it that easy. My parents still think I'm a kid. Why do I have the feeling I'm going to regret this in the morning? Look, Allison, you've had yourself a very rough first week. Mm -hmm. You owe yourself a little blowout. Come on, it'll be fun. Okay, and just so long as I don't have to look at any more pizza. All right, that was Kelly Maroney from Chopping Mall, and I really had a lot of fun talking with her. And uh, thank you so much, Kelly, for taking the time out of your day to join us here on The Hysteria Continues. But, um, you know, as we said, we have three more. Um, Eric? Yeah, we're going to... Uh go straight on with the interviews. I spoke to, a few days after you spoke to Kelly Maroney, I spoke to Russell Todd, who you might recognize the name. He is from, most famously, probably from Friday the 13th Part 2. He plays the character, uh, what's his name again? Scott. Scott, that's it, who, who hangs upside down from the tree and gets his throat slit. Uh, but he plays Rick in Chopping Mall, and uh, this is what he had to say. I don't want to hear it. Not another word. Me? No way. I covered this whole deal when I said for better or worse, remember? Of course I remember. I mean, who could forget that 48 stain right there in your tux? Okay, I'm delighted to welcome to the podcast this morning, this afternoon for me, uh, Russell Todd, who plays Rick in Chopping Mall. Good morning to you, Rick. Or Rick, Russell even. <laughs> You've already you so got my much. character going. I know. And I'm probably, going to call hey, you I'm probably going to call you Todd at some stage as well. because um, Most people do. So <laughs> if you think because I have two first yeah, names, it's totally cool. How uh, are you? Thank you so much, because it's still the working day for you over in Los Angeles. Uh, it's the end yeah, of the working oh. day for me. Um, can you tell us, first of all, how you got into acting, I suppose, originally? I actually wanted to be a film director my entire life and went to film school in upstate New York, Syracuse University. And while I was there, uh, I met someone who said, you should be in front of the camera. And I said, no, I really would love to direct. But he said, no, let me take some photos of you. And um, I actually ended up going to New York City and, and having a modeling career, a very successful modeling career for a few years. And then my modeling agent started settle, setting me, uh, sending me out on um, auditions and I started booking them, and uh, I thought, well, this you know, this is working too. And you know, I, and I was encouraged to go in that direction, and I did. And um, one of the first uh, jobs I had was "He Knows You're Alone." I saw it advertised, the audition advertised in backstage newspaper in New York, and I went on the audition, and um, and they cast me almost immediately, and that was the start of it. And had you had any training as an actor before that? I had, in, in school I was also, I was in the film school and the acting school and I was training as an actor too. Uh, but I really, my heart was set on directing. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I just, you know, was in the right place at the right time and things went well. And then I continued to train in New York uh, with Lee Strasberg at the Strasberg Institute and with uh, a couple other well-known people in New York. And when I moved to Los Angeles, I continued training there too. Okay. We're going to flash forward now to uh, what Jim Minorsky says was 1984, I believe, when the shooting of Chopping Mall commenced towards the end. Um, can you remember how you got involved in that project? That, I believe, was through an agent. I think I, my agent at that time submitted me uh, on that film, and I went up and I read for Jim. And Jim is a very affable, fun guy. And just I remember just him laughing in the audition and, and being a very cool person. And I really wanted to get involved because the Corman name was attached to it mm -hmm. as well. And um, I don't remember was if it, there was a callback or not. I think that Jim and I just hit it off, and he felt I was right for the character. And soon after, I was booked... Well, the impression, that, sorry, the impression I get from listening to the DVD commentary is that he spotted you in uh, Where the Boys Are 84 and thought you'd be perfect for the role. That might have been it. Uh, you, you probably know more than I do it so long. <laughs> well, I know that you said that because like, 1984 is 27 years ago and I struggle to remember anything of that year myself. Um, I was only 10 years old back then. Uh, so <laughs> I, I completely understand if, if your recollections aren't that, you know, clear but um uh like top 10 in 1984 included songs by prince let's go crazy stevie wonder i just called to say i love you and whams wake me up before you go go so does that wow, what rejig a... any memories <laughs> that's a flashback yeah <laughs> you weren't dancing around to them on the set of chopping mall were you oh i don't even remember what was what was playing <laughs> such a long time ago but... what do you remember anything about your co-stars uh, i'm thinking of kelly maroney barbara crampton tony o'dell and your on-screen love interest uh, carrie emerson 
what, what I remember, we were all having a great time. Mm-hmm. That's what I remember the most. We were all very young and, and doing this movie full of adventure and action. And, you know, here I'm carrying an AK-47 around in a gun and, and blowing up this mall, which was literally down the street from my home. And um, it was just a blast. We'd come into the mall after it closed and we'd work till, you know, early in the morning. And... Um, and we had the chance to, you know, they would put up plate glass doors to replace the real ones. And I could throw a crowbar through it and robots chasing us. And it was my first real action picture. And uh, it was a hoot. We were all laughing constantly. And, and we all felt you know, really blessed to be doing this movie. And uh, it's kind of fun to watch today and, and reminisce about those days. And uh, I guess being young and, and, and uh, having this opportunity to, to go wild inside a mall. Mm. Uh, speaking of your robotic co-stars, did they um, cause any problems on set? I mean, you hear the famous stories of Jaws, where the mechanical shark would constantly break down and cause delays. Was that the experience you had with the uh, robots on Chopping Mall? I do remember a few times the, the robots breaking down or not being properly controlled. I think they were you know, remotely controlled. Um, but... I think most of the time things went fine. Um, I don't know if you've heard from the other people in the cast of any other different stories, but uh, I don't recall much in the way of uh, technical malfunctions. Well, I think but the, the robots didn't go underwater. I think that was a, a bonus probably for the filmmakers. <laughs> yeah, no, no salt water eating away at their circuitry. Yeah, exactly, yeah. And Kelly Maroney <laughs> was telling us actually a funny story about the catering or lack of catering or lack of decent catering on the set. Can you remember that? Can you remember getting a cup full of whipped cream as a dessert? Uh, you know, I read that, uh, or I heard that in your podcast, and um, I don't recall that at all. You know, I may, it may have been so bad I blocked out the food entirely. <laughs> <laughs> how, did it, how did, actually, not just the catering, but how did the whole experience compare to what would have been, I suppose, a higher budget film in Friday the 13th Part 2? Um... It was like, you know, you, you, the budgets don't bother me. You know, I was so happy to be working as an actor. I didn't care. And we all knew it wasn't a big budgeted film and nothing was fancy, but everything was fine. We were treated well. Um, again, we were all laughing all the time. I mean, being chased by robots in a mall. Um, it's very different when you're in the picture. I mean, watching it is, is, is a very different experience for the actor, too, because then you come out and you see the whole thing put together. But when you're making it, it's lots of laughs, basically. And, uh, you know, you're kidding about the things and making fun of this and making fun of that. But when you see it, and it's put together. You go, oh, wow. You know, <laughs> they did a great job. It's it's very different experience viewing it. Mm-hmm. But I was just happy to be there and uh, never thought at all that, you know, this is low budget and, and um, this is, you know, why aren't they doing this or why aren't I getting this, you know, to make it easier for me. Uh, it was just a great experience. Uh, were you concerned at all about being typecast in horror films? Because this would have been your third in, in a fairly short <laughs> space of time. I did think about that once in a while, um, and it was fine. Again, I was just happy to be working, and I did veer off from that and do other things. Uh, so it, I really never was typecast. I did get a kick out of uh, dying almost identically the same way in two other horror films. Yes, which we, uh, <laughs> hanging from a tree. Yes, yes, which I thought was really typecast. Well, well, what we'll I got talk, a kick out of that. Do you get many people uh, contacting you about Chopping Mall? I get a lot of uh, fan mail, mostly about Friday the 13th Part 2 and yeah. other things I've done. Mm-hmm. Occasionally uh, a Chopping Mall fan, or I might see someone out who'll recognize me and they'll go, oh, weren't you also in Chopping Mall? I loved that. That was so kitschy. Or that, was, that was fun seeing you know, those robots kill all of you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, but most of the time it's other projects and, and not as much Chopping Mall. Yeah. And you've recently um, started doing horror conventions as well. How how do you yes. find those? Although uh, this last one, which I was supposed to go to, I couldn't go to because they uh, ended up uh, a production was actually filming in my home for that time period, so I couldn't leave. Oh, actually, but, filming um, in your house? Yes, I have my house registered with a couple of uh, oh, comp- sites uh, for film production and various things have shot here. You think I would know better being in the industry not to have someone come into my home and ruin it? But I've been very lucky so far. And ha- did they ruin it? No. No, never had a problem. I'm... Have they ever asked you to knock down a wall to make room for a camera or some lights? They did ask to take down a light fixture and something in the kitchen where pots and pans kind of hang in the center island, and that was fine, but um, nothing extreme, and I wouldn't want them or allow them to do anything extreme. I'm, mm. 
I don't want it that much. <laughs> Conventions are fun. I yeah. was supposed to go to this giant uh, horror convention back in, I believe it was Connecticut, but that for, as I said, I had to cancel it. But I look forward to going to other ones because the fans are so wonderful. They're, they're so excited to see you there from their favorite horror film. And um, they love to follow your career. And it's always fun to, you know, to meet people mm. and all over the country. Yeah, and is, is it always under the guise of um, Friday the 13th, part two that you go, or...? Uh, most of the time, yes. Yeah. It, it's horror in general, and usually it is Friday the 13th, part two. Mm. But I also, people know me also from some TV series, from yeah. other movies, uh, from a soap opera I did, and... Uh, well, you a did a couple of, of soap operas, didn't you? Yeah, well, one, the one I was on the longest was uh, Another World. I played Dr. Yeah. Jamie Frame for three We yeah. shot... Uh, about 50 weeks a year, and Ooh. you know, you had two weeks off, and yeah. it just went on and on five days a week yeah. in your so living. We room. never used to get them over this side of the Atlantic, but we, like we would really, just, yeah. And what was that fun working on a soap? Or was it, it sounds like awfully hard work? It is extremely hard work, and it, but it's a factory. I mean, you're learning mm. every day, you're learning so many lines. And I was one of the major characters in uh, Another World, and so some days I'd have 40, 50 pages not 50, but you know, 35, 40 pages to memorize, and uh. And you'd be there for, you know, from 7 in the morning sometimes to 1 a.m. the next morning. Uh, and other days it was great to come in and say a couple of lines and leave. So that was okay and made up for it. Uh, was there times when you were on the set of Another World wishing you could be in a shopping mall being chased by killer robots? <laughs> I've already had that experience. I don't need to relive it. Yes. <laughs> um, so, Russell, before uh, we leave the shopping mall subject, can I just ask you what uh, you're up to now? Sure. Uh, I own an agency um, uh, that represents uh, many, many steady cam operators, very specialized camera operators in the industry around the U.S. and other parts of the world. And uh, I'm an agent to them as an actor has an agent. And um, I love what these guys do. I think they're incredibly talented. And, uh, and these guys shoot most of the major movies, TV shows, commercials, music videos that the world sees. And I still get excited like a kid when a, when a famous director of photography calls me, who I know and I love their work, and, and asks to hire one of my clients. Mm -hmm. When they call me, it's just like, wow, I really respect your work. And, you know, I don't want to be too much of a fan because I'm an agent here. <laughs> but uh, when these guys call, it, it, it's really uh, it's, it's, it's exciting for me. And, yeah. again, I, I love what my clients do, and, and it's very specialized. And I'm very blessed to be in a terrific business. Mm. Because Steadicam, of course, is very important to slasher movies um, when you think back to Halloween in particular. Oh, yeah. yeah. Following the yeah, yeah. point of view uh, shots and, and, and following people for, for long distances mm. without having to lay a dolly track. Yeah. It's crucial in so many movies and TV shows. Mm. Well, Russell, listen, thank you very much for taking time out of your working day, not just your day, but actually you're busy at work at the moment, I know. And thank you for talking to us about Chopping Mall. It's my pleasure, Eric. Thank you very much for having me. Allison, you all right? I think so. Where to? Escalator, third level. What about the doors? We can't lock them. They'll get through. Maybe so. Maybe not. Let's go. Okay, that was Russell Todd speaking to me from California. And during the interview, he mentioned that he, uh, his house is sometimes used for filming. And I emailed him afterwards and said, would it have appeared in any films we might have seen? And he said, no, that it, it's not really used for feature films as such. It's more for commercials. So I was, you can't keep your eye out for Russell Todd's house, I'm afraid. Um, some behind the scenes on the film. Now, as Justin said earlier, it was Julie Corman who was the producer on the film. That's Roger Corman's wife. And she approached Jim Wynorski to do... Uh, a kids in a shopping mall being chased by a killer. Uh, Jim Wynorski was influenced by a 1954 science fiction film called Gog, which I haven't seen, but I've watched the trailer online and it's it's kind of similar-ish. It's got robots in it that run on treads and they've got pincers for hands and they, they are under the influence of some alien force and turn kind of murderous. So that's um, where Jim Wynorski sort of uh, got the influence to alter the idea of killers and make them killer robots instead. It was made for $800,000 in late 1984, although there are some doubts about uh, the date of filming, uh, Jim Wynorski says on the DVD commentary it was late 1984, but then he says other things that kind of uh, contradict that. He says that he saw 
he cast um, Barbara Crampton after seeing her in Reanimator, but Reanimator wasn't released until October of 1985, so he's thrown that into doubt. Um, the film It was filmed in the Sherman Oaks Galleria, and that had been used in lots of other films as well. It was uh, used in Fast Times at Ridgemount High, Valley Girl, Commando, Back to the Future Part 2, Terminator 2, Phantom of the Mall, Eric's Revenge, not me. It was used in Walk Like a Man, which starred the lovely Amy Steele, and also Inner Space. So it's obviously a, a sort of a regular place for filming for Hollywood folk. Um, the production team created their own furniture shop because... They needed, obviously, to break things and make things explode. So, But apparently it was so convincing that people would actually come into the shop uh, looking to purchase things and they had to be told, sorry, this is actually just a set for this sort of killer robot movie that we're filming at the time. Uh, it was filmed over four weeks of night shoots. It would, they'd start when the mall closed. Uh, the only thing that didn't close in the mall was the cinema, which was upstairs in the mall. Uh, and the print on the DVD is a full screen print, and it exposes part of the frame where you can actually see people, uh, particularly during Dick Miller's death scene, you can see people at the top of the screen uh, wandering to and from the the cinema. Kind of it destroys the illusion somewhat. It, uh, I didn't notice it now until it was mentioned on, on the commentary, so it probably isn't that intrusive. The robots themselves were designed by uh, Robert Short. And now we, uh, Justin, you spoke to him about uh, his involvement in the film The Slayer, which we discussed in the podcast uh, a few months back. Right. Uh, it, yeah. it, it's a, it was a uh, print interview, so it's available on the Hysteria Lives website. Uh, and he's worked on some like absolutely terrific films. Joe Dante's Piranha, uh, a film that I'm probably the only person that loves it, is Star Trek The Motion Picture. He also worked on E.T. And he directed a film in 1987 called Program to Kill, which looks like it might be America's answer to Lady Terminator, the Indonesian film. I don't know if any of you guys have seen that. Oh, yeah. Yes. That one? yeah. <laughs> Fantastic. Is and I haven't bites, seen Program to Kill, but it w- looks... Mm. Sorry, is that, Sorry the one where, the... Um, is that the one where she bites men's penises off? Or is that a different film? That's Eve of Destruction. Oh, is There's it? one scene like that in Eve of Destruction where... Lady Terminator... Sorry, Lady Terminator's an Indonesian film. Yeah, there was one film where they, it was kind of like a similar thing like that. It, I thought it was that film where there's a I classic bit of dialogue now, yeah. and he says, um, well, that we find some, he says they they find some men with their cocks bitten off and they said maybe they were attacked <laughs> by small animals or something. I but, do remember um, there's a scene where she's topless and she's gone out with a machine gun hmm. in Lady Terminator. Maybe See, yeah, everyone's yeah. kind of riffed on that idea. There's a movie called Eve of Destruction where this woman, she's a female android and she's going hmm. around killing people and she takes this like, redneck guy back to this hotel room and he's like you know he basically wants her to go down on him and she starts doing that and then she ends up biting his uh tackle off as it were so uh i guess they kind of riffed on that idea isn't, from, isn't there somebody really famous in eva destruction gregory hines oh yes yes well he was really famous yeah, yeah. Ooh. Ooh. oh i didn't mean it like that oops uh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, changing the subject, uh, the the voices of the robots were provided by Jim Wynorski himself. Mm. Uh, speaking of Jim Wynorski, this was his second film. His first was The Lost Empire. Of his other oeuvre, the only one I have, the only two I've seen actually are Sorority House Massacre 2 and 976 Evil 2. Uh, I've yet to expose myself, uh, <laughs> if so to speak. Oops, I, maybe I should rephrase that. I've yet to see uh, House on Hooter Hill, Cleavage Field, or The Devil Wears Nada, although I do like the titles. Oh. Yeah. Ooh, I like those. He I does. want to see Cleavage Field. <laughs> yeah, me too. I've By seen the, the Bear Winch uh, Project. Oh my god, those movies are so good. I love that movie. I love the Bear Winch. <laughs> the Bear Winch By the way, Project. Eric, your um your exposing comment deserves an Uber misses. It yes. does. But we don't have anything. But also I saw he also directed The Hills Have Thighs yes. and Busty Cops <laughs> Go Hawaiian. Mm. So the Busty Cops series, which I, I must admit I haven't seen, and um, I'm probably not going to look up. But um, yeah, no, it's any, anything else, Eric? On um, well, I have a few other things, but I'll yeah. hand it over to uh, to Nathan. Do you have any any behind the scenes info on on Chopping Mall? Not at this moment in time. Okay, but <laughs> after the Barbara, I, yeah, <laughs> after the Barbara Crampton interview, I do have a little bit of trivia how I can link Chopping Mall to Psycho. Ooh. Ooh. That sounds intriguing. Well, yeah. what about you, Joseph? Do you do you have um, anything as as creative as linking Chopping Mall to Psycho? Well, not as creative, but uh, you spoke of the Sherman Oaks Galleria, which mm. uh, had you know Fast Times at Ridgemont High was filmed there, and my favorite action film, Commando, was filmed there in parts. But apparently, that mall has been torn down now, oh. and um, 
Also, apparently, it was kind of famous for a while there for uh, having a few celebrity shoppers like Molly Ringwald used to shop there. And people would go there just to see if they could spot some of the celebrities shopping there. But, you know, aside from, you know, having celebrities come to shop there, it never really did very well financial wise. So they had to tear it down and build a smaller kind of uh, establishment there. But um, I also know about uh, there is an extremely rare TV version of Chopping Mall that has some extended footage, uh, has a, apparently some more aerial shots of the mall and uh, a few more character kind of scenes, uh, particularly with Ferdy and uh, more of the Attack of the Crab Monsters uh, segment where they're watching that. But um, it hasn't been released to DVD as far as I know, and I think actually finding that print is – proved kind of uh, difficult for anyone looking for it. I mean, it showed, uh, I mean, I th- from what I understand, it showed like on TV, like USA or uh, TBS, like in 1989 or 1990 with that extended footage. But since then has not, has not been shown and I'm not sure if it'll ever see the light of day again, but it's out there somewhere. That kind of makes sense because there's some information floating on the web that says, because <clears throat> the film was first released under the title Killbots in March 1986, and some sources say that it was in a slightly longer version than Chopping Mall, possibly anywhere between 6 and 15 minutes longer. Yes, uh, uh, I think the Killbots title is the one they showed on USA back in the late 80s or early 90s, and it had mm. the extended footage. Uh, I would like to see some of that, actually. Yeah, me too, actually, yeah. Uh, Justin, do you have any behind the scenes tidbits for us only a few bits and pieces um i think you've covered uh most of it but again what kind of um points to the film being directed or sorry made in late 85 um is the fact is the variety uh reported that uh, principal photography had finished in their june sorry january the 31st 1986 um uh issue and it seems like it would be a very long time for a year to go past if there was um, principal photography had been in 84, but then reporters being finished in 86. So, I mean, that was just one thing. Um, uh, and as you say, it got released as Killbots in March 86. I found absolutely no evidence anywhere. I mean, obviously did. It, Variety says it got um, released. But um, I have a, uh, a, a subscription, um, online subscription, which you look back through old newspapers from um, America in the 1980s, well, right back to the turn of the last century. But um, uh, And you can do a search by, by names. Uh, Chopping Mall came up quite a lot. Uh, but not any adverts or anything. It was, but it's on double bills and stuff in um, October 1986 at American cinemas. Um, but no reference at all for Killbots. So I imagine the release was was pretty tiny. But the film, as Joseph said, was shown on um, American cable the next year um, as Killbots, not Chopping Mall. Um, but obviously came out on video very soon. I think it came, came out on video in something like April 1987 in America and probably about the same time in the UK and Ireland, I would imagine. Um, apart from uh, other few things, um, just things that you haven't mentioned uh, so far, was uh, I think Minorsky was inspired by uh, that sci-fi f- film you're talking about, but also by Trapped which was mm. a 1970s TV movie set in the mall where James Brolin is um, pursued by guard dogs. Um, and I think he said that was a kind of inspiration as well. And in fact, I think they were originally taught, thinking about using dogs rather than robots in the film, but obviously he decided that it had already been done um, and that they shouldn't go down that route uh, I'm just trying to think if there's anything else. Um, oh, just a couple of things, other things I've written down when I was watching the film. Uh, it has the classic Dalek um, conundrum to this film as well. It's why not just run upstairs? Because uh, these robots are on um, kind of uh, sort of um, tank wheels, aren't they? So they couldn't go upstairs like Daleks, although recent Daleks can hover. But um, these, I don't think these robots could. Uh, and I think he was sort of saying they um, they, they made the, the robots and they actually changed the mall um, location from the one they originally decided were going to do it in. And where they shot, the escalators were actually much smaller. 
so they had to shoot uh, some scenes with the robots going up the escalator by actually having someone inside part of the costume of the robot so it wasn't actually the full robot going up the escalator because it would have been stuck so another good way of getting um, uh, you know getting past that uh, obviously uh, the other thing that hasn't been mentioned was in the cafe where Kelly and Barbara's characters work is on all the walls are Roger Corman um, uh, posters including Slumber Party Massacre is up there and um, what else is there? Well, um, the last the last Empire poster is up there as well, which was Jim Minorsky's first film. This was his second. That's right, and mm. he also he kind of remade this film uh, later in a film called Hard to, to Die. Has anyone seen that? Oh God, oh, yes. Hard to Die is one of my favorite movies of all time. I, th- I thought that was supposed to be more of a remake of Sorority House Massacre Two. No, well, it kind of is, but it's basically, I mean, not so much a remake, but it's taking the same idea of what it's got is like um, scantily clad ladies, busty ladies, Whoa. in a oh, yeah, in a um, high rise tower block being chased around by a killer, and it kind of, but it has, but they've all running around with machine guns and shooting, so it was as you're talking about chopping mall is kind of perhaps got more in common in some um areas um with a, like an action movie rather than a slash movie and he kind of did that with of hard to die which was made around about the same time as um sorority house massacre 2 which he also directed um but he seems to be pumping out these um as we said like the um cleavage field and the hills have thighs and the busty cops go to um hawaii uh, so th- th- he's he's pumping these out, which I haven't seen any of these, but I don't know. Um, uh, uh, how about you, Nathan or Joseph? Have you seen any of those? All I've seen is the Bear Winch series, which, like I said earlier, is phenomenal. Is it good? The Bear, is it the Bear Winch is a really silly kind of take on Blair Witch Project, but it's really it's funny. It's a deadpan parody. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Hmm. So because I just thought it would just be lots of women whipping their tops off. It is. Off. Oh. It is. That's what it is. Yes. But <laughs> it's, it's kind of funny and in places i think you know it's got women doing things like you know they're walking outside and one says oh my god my boobies are so hot they need out and then she busts out of her top (laughs) (laughs) you definitely need to it's something you have to see to believe he seems Mm. like such a nice man on the um on the the uh the documentary on the on i know he He loves his scantily clad women he does Mm. he's a man after my own heart (laughs) <laughs> do you have any? Do you do you have any other um, behind the scenes info, Justin? Um, I'm just having a look here. At what I've written down. I don't think I've much more apart from. Okay, well, I, I thought I was I was going to say. Um, Russell um, said that actually it was the film that he he remembered. The who's, 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 who's someone who dropped Hello. There? Hello. I yeah. have not moved an inch. I swear. No. Was that you? you may have to edit this part out. No, I, I'm staying oh. still. Ooh, who too. is that then? Wasn't any of us. How it was it? It sounded like sounded like somebody had gone down on the microphone. It's all that sexy talk. It's all that sexy talk. Um, yeah. But no, it's just funny. I thought it's funny when Russell was saying. I mean, when we're talking, we're talking to people and saying, "Oh, do you remember about these films you shot 25, 30 years ago?" And if someone said to me, "What were you doing 25 years ago?" I wouldn't have a clue. Uh, so I can understand how people don't remember it. But um, when Russell was saying, he obviously gets asked more and more about, well, it's always about Friday 13th Part 2 normally. Um, and he said he didn't really remember that much about making Chopping Mall. But actually having watched the film, it's kind of film I thought it'd be quite difficult not to remember making, especially his end scene where he has some kind of almost kind of kamikaze yes. um, end, doesn't he? Suicide. And he gets on uh, a kind on of a, disability. Yeah. Is it one of those little disability um, scooters? And kind of like that, and he, he drives into, into the, the robot at like four miles an hour. Exactly, yeah. and and then falls <laughs> over, pretending to be electrocuted. Um, and I would have thought that, that, that you would remember that. So, um, but uh, yeah, it was those late night shoots, I guess. Yes. So, um, do we want to um, cut to some of the other interviews, and we can come back and wrap things up? Yep. Mm-hmm. And find out what Nathan's um, little, you know, mystery oh, piece yeah. is. It's the twist okay, ending well, to this podcast. <laughs> okay. And uh, okay, well, I spoke to Tony O'Dell, who plays Ferdy in the film, and he had also been in The Karate Kid before uh, filming Chopping Mall, and this is what he had to say. Michael 
Sid finds out that you do this, I'm dead. I oh, don't tell me, Ferdy. You going chicken shit on us again? We already agreed. He trusts me to take care of the store while he's gone. He ain't gonna know diddly unless you tell him. And you ain't gonna tell him, are you? Hey, look, don't force me to pull rank. Okay, we're joined now by Tony O'Dell, who plays Ferdy in Chopping Mall, the love interest of Kelly Maroney. Good morning to you, Tony. Uh, well, I should say good evening to you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the wonders of Skype. Yeah, I've, uh, I've um, already got my morning hike in. Oh, very good. It's only 10 a.m. over there as well. That's right. You must have been up very early. Yeah, I get up early, get the hike done, and, uh, you know, I had to get ready for the interview. <laughs> well, can you tell us, first of all, how you got involved in Chopping Mall? Uh, well, I had uh, an agent at the time who um, just sent me on the audition. I think I had just, um, it was like, I know there'd been a, some discussion as to whether or not it was 83 or 84, and to be honest with you, I'm not quite sure. Well, on the uh, on the DVD commentary, uh, Jim Winorski says it was October of 1984 that the shooting commenced. Okay, well, I'm going to have to go with that <laughs> because it's, uh, you know, it's quite a wise, uh, ways ago, so, uh, you know, I'm trying to remember what was going on at the mm. time I finished doing Karate Kid, I mm-hmm. believe. Yeah, where you were, one of, you were one of the bad guys who was very mean to poor Ralph Macchio. Yeah, poor Ralph. Yeah, yeah. I was one of the... Uh, the Cobra Kai's. You know, actually, there were only four Cobra Kai's um, originally cast, and then uh, John Abelton, the director, um, I met with him, and he said, you know what, I want to make you the fifth, and so, yeah, I became the fifth uh, Cobra Kai. And what a great film to be in. One of my uh, all-time favorites, I have to say. Yeah, thanks. Mm. Yeah, it, it was a, it's a great film, and, you know, it still holds up today. Mm, definitely, yeah. That's pretty much how, how it was, is uh, my agent sent me... Uh, on the audition, and I think I maybe went back maybe one other time, uh, one callback, and, uh, and that was it. Mm. And when you looked at the script and it was you being chased by killer robots in a shopping mall, did you think, yes, this looks like it could be fun, or were you dubious about whether it was going to be just a low-budget, schlocky, not terribly entertaining film? No, at the time, I just pretty much thought, hey, this just, you know, it sounds like uh, sounds like fun. It was a great company to be working with, and um, uh, yeah, I knew it, it, there was definitely some uh, some question there in terms of you know being chased by robots and and uh, this and that. But you know, ultimately, I just thought this was going to be fun, um, aside from having to shoot all night long. Yes. Month. I was going to ask, was, was that difficult? Because you literally had to wait for the mall to close and then shoot all through the night. Yeah, it was difficult for me. I'm someone who really loves my sleep and I don't like my sleep interrupted. I am with you on that one. <laughs> so, um, I remember, you know, having to wake up at like 5 o'clock or, you know, 5.30 in the evening and getting to the mall sometime around 6 and, you know, you're eating breakfast at dinner time. Mm. And then uh, the mall would shut down at nine. Um, while it was shutting down, we were just you know finishing up with hair and makeup, and then we would pretty much shoot all night long. And what was really weird was when you know we left work in the morning. It was eight o'clock in the morning, and people were arriving to the mall to go to work, and we were going home. And I had to black out all of my windows in my bedroom with aluminum foil so that you know I could keep the light out and pretend it was nighttime while I slept during the day. Mm. Must have been very difficult. Had you, had you done night shoots before or since on a film? Um, you know, any night shoots I might have done before that were, you know, maybe a night here, a night there on a film where you, um, you know, where you, where you do that. But it was not, it's never been a, a constant thing like Chopping Mall was. And I've done, you know, on Karate Kid we had you know, some some nights where, uh, like the, the scene in Karate Kid where we were all running across the field. Yes, know, dressed as skeletons, outfits. yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, I remember that going, you know, pretty late into the night. And um, I was the acting coach for the movie Diary of a Wimpy Kid. All right, yeah. Yeah, so uh, um, I flew up to Vancouver and, and uh, worked with the whole cast on that film for... 
a couple of months. And, you know, there was a few nights here or there, but it's nothing like, it's nothing like having it be four weeks straight. Yes. I can imagine that was tough. I can really, really uh, appreciate the people who do the graveyard shift. <laughs> um, what are your memories of working with Jim Wynorski? This was his second film. You know, Jim was, was and always has been just a really fun guy. And, um, you know, he just tell, pretty much tells you like it is. And, you know, he was always laughing and having fun. But he gets really, you know, he got really into it. And, you know, let you make suggestions and, you know, it's like, yeah, 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 that's good. That's good. Go with that. Or, or, um, no, 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 I don't, I don't care for that. He just, he was very easy to, to talk to and you knew either he liked something or he just told you if he didn't and you moved on. Um, but you know, we had a good time. Mm. And, uh, what was the, um, the chemistry like between you and your co-stars were, were you good friends off screen? Oh, yeah. We all got along really well and still do. I mean, I still see Kelly um, from time to time. And um, I adore Kelly. She's, mm-hmm. she's wonderful. And um, I haven't seen Nick Siegel mm-hmm. um, for, for a really long time, maybe since we did the film. I haven't seen Barbara Crampton. Um, although I just saw pictures of her on Facebook. She looks great. Mm. And she's actually best friends still with Kelly Maroney. Yeah, they're, mm. they're still really close. Mm. Um, and Russell Todd is one that I've, you know, I, I run into over the years and, mm. and, uh, and we're friends and, uh, we'll, you know, we'll chat every now and then. Mm. So we've all, you know, stayed pretty close. I haven't talked to John Terleski in a really long time. I know he's busy, uh, directing and doing stuff. So. But I haven't seen him for a long time. Mm. Uh, and what are your memories of the special effects sequences on Choppy Mall? In particular, there's one um, quite outstanding effect where uh, someone's head is, exp- you know, is blown up by one of the killer robots. Do you remember the night that was filmed? I was standing right there. That was one thing I had to see. <laughs> um, you know, I remember being, in, you know, just kind of like being behind the scenes and and watching them you know do the special effects whether it was the robots or or um you know certain prosthetic pieces especially that head and how they created that that head um you know to blow up and have it be inserted so clearly look like her head had been blown up um and i thought it came off really really well uh, but, I, you know, we were all right there and, you know, standing there as they were uh, shooting the prosthetic head being blown up with all the blood and whatnot being blasted out of it. And, uh, you know, we pretty much did the same reaction off camera, which was just, you know, ew. <laughs> I suppose uh, there was probably nowhere for you to go. You probably just had to hang around and watch everything. Yeah, you know, that's pretty much what we did. You know, if, if uh, we, we hung out and watched, and if you were just getting too tired, at least I know in my respect, if I was getting tired, well, heck, we had a furniture store we could go lay down in. You were actually allowed into it, yes? Well, you know, we'd, we, we shot scenes in it, yeah. and if it was still there, whatever, you know, you'd go lay on the couch. Or, but I remember... Um, Sometimes just finding any spot I could just to kind of curl up and, and sleep for a while and, you know, catch a little sleep. But it was, you know, it was weird. We're eating, we're eating a catered lunch at 3 o'clock in the morning. Mm. Did you do any of your own stunts in the film? There's a scene towards the end where you get pulverized with a um, fire extinguisher. Yeah, I, um, I did. In fact, I can't even remember now, and Kelly could probably uh, refresh my, re- my memory on this. But the scene where we fell through the glass table, mm. um, that I don't believe we did. Mm. Um, I remember doing a lot of stuff, and um, I've done a lot of stuff in, in some of the other projects I've done. But um, the, the fire extinguisher, yeah, but, but I don't think, I don't know. Now I'm not so sure. I'm, 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 I'm trying to recall if we actually did that falling through, you know, breakable mm. glass onto a mat. Um, Kelly would know better than I. Mm. Well, she says that um, 
all the stunts bar one were actually her. There was just one fall from, from sort of two or three floors up that they got a professional in to do, but she did the rest herself. Yeah, and I remember that fall, being there and, and seeing that stunt person take that fall. Mm. Um, but come to think of it, I think whenever I do see a clip of us falling through the glass table in the, in the furniture store, I recall always saying, that was me. Do you get many people asking you about Chopping Mall? Do you, do you get recognized in the street at all? I get stares, and I never know why. Yeah. <laughs> well, I suppose it could um, be for Karate Kid either or, or various other projects you worked on. Yeah, and probably the, probably the most you know, popular show that I was known for here in the States in terms of television was Head of the Class, yeah, yeah. Um, which uh, you know, Billy Connolly did the last year of, of, mm. uh, of the show. But I did wall, you know, 114 episodes of the show, and um, that's usually the one that I get recognized the most for. Yeah. But, you know, even then, it's funny because if I'm wearing a suit or a tie, like my character did in Head of the Class, people are um, much more apt to recognize me. Yeah. You know, I can be at a wedding or I can be at a funeral <laughs> and wearing a suit with a tie, and someone will come up to me and say, oh, yeah, you, we went to school together, and... I'm like, you know, no, we didn't go to school together. And, you know, I pretty much know where they're going. Yeah. And I'm like, no, we went to, we were in Miss Smith class in Boise, Idaho. I'm like, no, it was not there. <laughs> um, so it's always when I'm wearing something like that. And also with, with Chopping Mall, you know, it's a little different because I'm wearing the glasses. Mm. And I'm wearing, uh, you know, the shirt and the, yeah. the tight khaki pants. It's that classic um, 80s thing where they get sort of a good-looking actor and put sort of large glasses on him and he becomes automatically the nerd who has, you know, you know, boundless technical expertise and knows everything. Yeah, we want to make him like the, the, the nerdy Clark Kent. Yes. Um, I remember, though, with, uh, with the wardrobe, I think the glasses were mine. I know the pants were mine because we were doing a little bit of a wardrobe fitting and <clears throat> I brought in a few clothes I had in my closet. And I grabbed the khaki pants and uh, put them on. <clears throat> Excuse me. And Jim Wynorski looks at them and I go, well, you know, they're a little tight. They're from like eight years ago. So they're a little too tight and they're about two inches too short. And Jim was like, they're perfect. <laughs> I kind of had wished I didn't bring those, those pants in because I really wasn't too crazy about wearing them. But um, actually ended up being pretty funny. <laughs> and have you seen Chopping Mall at all recently, or is it literally 25 years since you've seen it? Uh, I think I probably saw it maybe six months ago. Oh. Had some friends that, uh, you know, who always get friends in the house who say, hey, what's this? You know, <laughs> let's see this. I haven't seen it. And is, is that something you enjoy? Uh. Yeah, I do. I mean, mm. I enjoy now just sitting back and kind of, of, of laughing and enjoying it. Yeah. And there are some parts we'll all watch and I'll be like, oh, okay, I'm not too crazy about the acting here. Or, um, but uh, I enjoy the film. Mm. I, I enjoy it. It's fun. And um, I have a lot of great memories from it. So I'll usually, you know, kind of say, no, 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 you can just take it home. And they say, no, no, sit down and watch it with us. So. <laughs> I, uh, when I do, I usually do enjoy it. Oh, that's good. And um, tell us, uh, Tony, what are you doing these days? Uh, these days, I am coaching um, actors. I coached on the series George Lopez for uh, almost six years. Mm -hmm. And uh, worked with George Lopez on a few projects after that. And then I went to uh, Vancouver, like I said, and coached um, all of the young actors on the first uh, Diary of a Wimpy Kid movie. Mm -hmm. And then I came back to L.A. and I got a job coaching on Disney Channel's Shake It Up. Uh, there's an episode that just aired that had a little robot in it where Flynn, <laughs> the younger boy in the show, he actually finds a toy robot named Fizzbang. Uh -huh. And uh, I'm the voice of uh, of the toy robot, so oh, I guess right. the robot thing keeps following me. And did you use your your previous knowledge of robots from Chopping Mall as influence for the voice? <laughs> um, it was a little bit different than that robot yes. in uh, um, in Chopping Mall because I remember that voice was very you know 
have a nice day, mm. just very, but it was really low and deep. Mm. I th actually think um, it was Jim Minorsky doing the voice for the robots, if I remember correctly. I think correctly. so, yeah. yeah. Yeah, where um, this character was more of, you know, my name is Fizbang, I want to be your best friend. <laughs> Very good. So mm. I do a lot, of, uh, a lot of voiceovers. I get a chance to do some on Shake It Up, and about uh, four weeks ago there was an episode called Battle of Hoots It Up, and I actually played a casting director on the episode. So oh. it's fun, you know, it's mm. a great group of people. Um, I love working with uh, the cast and the, the crew. Everybody there is, is great. Our executive producers and um, the show's doing really well. The they are. I mean, are those really hard. And yeah, those Disney awesome. shows are huge over here. And and um, Selena Gomez. I know she's not from Shake It Up, but she's um, certainly making waves over here at the moment. Although I do believe our title song is sung by Selena. Yes, Gomez. yes, yes. Well, Tony, thank you very much for taking time out of your day on a Sunday morning to talk to us here at the Hysteria Continues. Well, thank you, and I hope to uh, fly over there and see you all soon. Stop right there. Buddy! Allison, get the hell out of here! And a big thank you there to Tony O'Dell, who played Ferdy in Chopping Mall. Thank you for speaking to us, Tony. And a big thank you also to Barbara Crampton, who we're just going to hear now, and her thoughts on working 25 years ago with Killer Robots on Chopping Mall. What in Hobby Brain ordered that? Guy over there. Oh, God. I should have known. That orca beach is here every night. Always trying to snag some skin. Play it safe, Alice, and serve at arm's length if you get my drift. Well, it's a great pleasure now to welcome the lovely Barbara Crampton, star of Chopping Mall, to the podcast. A very good morning to you, Barbara. Thank you, Eric. How are you? I'm very good, thank you. I can't believe that sort of five minutes ago I was doing the washing up and, and now I'm talking to the horror icon that is Barbara Crampton. <laughs> Life is strange. It is strange, yeah. Um, Barbara, I've been watching the DVDs of Chopping Mall and uh, Reanimator in this past week, and I'm, I've just been trying to get the timeline right. It would appear that you filmed Chopping Mall before Reanimator. Would that be right? You know, it's funny because I, I actually hadn't watched Chopping Mall for a really long time. So, I mean, literally maybe 15 years. So I watched it last night. Mm-hmm. And I said to my husband, I said, I don't remember if I did this movie before Reanimator or not. And I'll have to look that up on IMDb because I didn't even remember. And I didn't look it up. So if anybody looks it up on IMDb, they can tell me. Yeah, I well, I don't know, but I, I think you may be right about that. Yeah. Well, on the, um, the commentary track to Chopping Mall, Jim Minorsky says it uh, started filming in October of 1984. And the impression I get from the commentary track on Reanimator is that it started filming sort of closer to Christmas of 1984. You know what? That's mm. probably mm. true because I remember while we were filming Reanimator, and it was most, mostly night shoots, I booked a theatrical tour to London right after that. And, and on Christmas Day, I remember I had about two hours sleep and I had to get up on Christmas Day right after shooting the final scene for Reanimator and get on a plane and go to London and see Maggie Smith in a play. And I was exhausted. <laughs> I can imagine. Well, you had to do night shoots as well on Shopping Mall, so it must have been quite a crazy end of the year for you. A few, a crazy few months, yeah. yeah, yeah. So how did you end up in this film uh, being chased around a shopping mall by killer robots? I, <laughs> uh, it was just my bloody good luck, I guess. <laughs> um, I, I just remember going and auditioning. It was at the Roger Corman Studios, and Julie Corman was actually the one who was the producer of the movie. And I think I read for Jim, and, and Kelly Maroney may have been there. I think she may have been there because they wanted some um, chemistry, some good chemistry between she and I. And so I think we had that too. And we became friends later, so that was nice. Um, you know, it's just regular going in, auditioning for a part, and getting called back, and that was that. And did you, it, was it a role you liked? Because your, your character starts out kind of sassy and confident, but then sort of loses the plot once the killer robots come on. Yeah. Would you have preferred yeah. to have Kelly's role? Yeah, she, she, she loses her mind, yes. um, my character, a little bit. Um, she seems very confident and, and, as you say, very sassy. And the lines of dialogue she had were pretty, pretty out there, too. <laughs> you know, like, um, hey, babe, it is babe, isn't it? Oh, we're going to have fun totally to the max. <laughs> um, well, it is the 80s. Yeah. Yeah. Just, it was just such silly dialogue, really. But it was fun. I had a lot of fun with that. And, um, it was a fun character to play, and 
I seem to, you know, scream a lot. So that's always fun for me too. Yeah. Do you remember anything? Was there fun behind the scenes when the camera wasn't rolling or were you literally all uh, lying down catching, you know, a bit of sleep you when know, you could? We were, I mean, we were, I can remember laying down anywhere I could catch a nap. I mean, it was hard, you know, I just, I just did a movie recently and we had night shoots and because I'm an adult, I was able to force myself to go to sleep in the morning and kind of sleep during the day. But in this movie, we're all kids. So we were burning the candle at both ends. I mean, I was up during the day. I would take a nap before I had to go to work. And that just wasn't enough to get me through the night. And it was the case for all of us. So I can remember sleeping next to a potted plant <laughs> in, the, in the middle of the mall, the Sherman Oaks Galleria, and just falling asleep or, you know, leaning up against some glass wall and just falling asleep for 10 minutes. I mean, anywhere <laughs> that we could get a little cat nap was the, helpful the glamour so, of hollywood yes yeah. but we had a lot of fun you know we were all the same age and you know just starting out in hollywood and it was we, we had a great time i know you're and, still in touch with um kelly maroney but um have you kept in touch with any of the, of the other actors um not really i i in the way back when i used to run into nick siegel a few times a year somewhere at an audition or something and and I know that John Terleski became a director and I never met him again or, or worked for him but uh, you know I kind of keep up with what other people have been doing but uh, Kelly's really the only one who's remained my friend and we still hang out and talk to this day yeah I know because you were you went to a very interesting um, theater show the other week yeah yes. we went to yeah, I brought her with me to see Reanimator the Musical. And how was that? Was that your first time to see it? That was my second time. Ah. I went for the opening night and I was blown away. It's really fantastically good. It's, it's just so satirical and so out there and there's so much more blood than there was even in the movie and the song and dance numbers by the ghouls. It was just brilliant. Um, and then I went back with Kelly um, a couple of weeks ago and uh, brought some other people and it was just as good or if not better. I mean, they're, they're amazing. I think they want to take the musical to New York if they can. They, they might try to go to San Francisco first or go to Chicago. And then I think ultimately they'd like to take it to New York. I, I think it's really fabulous. And it's, it's directed by Stuart Gordon, isn't it? The stage it show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's directed by him and, you know, Basically, a lot of the same lines from the movie are in the play, and um, the people are just really extraordinary. I'm just, really, I really I'd be love curious it. <laughs> to see how they do the um, special effects on stage because they yeah. look so elaborate in the film. Yes, it is, and and um, it's really very clever, and it's it's better than you could think that it would be. Mm. The special effects it's it's done by the same guys who worked on the movie too. Mm. Well, I mean, I've, I've watched a tiny clip of it on the um, official website and they've got the reanimating fluid down to a T. It, it, it literally glows in the dark. Glows? Yeah. I don't know how they do that. I, I don't know. Yeah. I, I, I watched that and I was like, how are they making that work? That yeah. looks really good. Yeah. Were you approached at all to, to have any part in the musical? No, I was not. I don't think there's any part I could play. Plus, I live in San Francisco, mm. and mm. that would be kind of hard, and I have small children. Oh, right. um, but I, I do understand that Stuart told me he offered the part of Dr. Hill to Jeffrey Combs, mm. but it just didn't work out for Jeffrey to do it. And then um, he offered, offered the part of um, the guy who is the, uh, what's his character's name? Mace, he's sort of the security guard. Yeah. He offered that to um, Ken Foray mm -hmm. from From Beyond. Yeah. And Ken said, in Stuart's words, "No, man, I can't sing." <laughs> yeah. Can I ask you? Are you a horror fan yourself? I am. And yes, were you? I... And were you before you started um, acting in the, in horror films? Yes. When I was younger, I wouldn't actually categorically say that I was a horror fan, but I started out at a very long, young age, maybe seven or eight, watching um, Dark Shadows and The Twilight Zone, The Outer Limits with my dad, you know, after school. So yeah, I definitely had that bent towards things that I liked. 
And looking back on Chopping Mall 25 years later, mm-hmm. do, you, do you think it's still fun or do you cringe watching it or what's your reaction? Probably both. Probably both. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. I mean, it's hard to watch yourself as an actor. Um, and I feel a little bit better being more removed from it. Um, I think it's a fun little movie mm. and I'm surprised that people still enjoy it as much as they do. Um, and yes, I definitely do cringe when I say some of the lines and when I scream as much as I scream in the movie. <laughs> and I go, oh my God, I was so overacting, you know? No, I don't well, disagree. Well, I do that. But it's, again, it's hard to watch yourself, so you don't mm. know. But, um, but I think overall it's, you know, great, silly fun. And do, do many people um, ask you about Chopping Mall or is, does it get kind of lost, you know, is it lost in the shadow of Reanimator and From Beyond? Um... That's probably partly true. And then again, I am surprised when people say, oh my God, Chopping Mall, I loved that. That was my favorite movie of all the ones you've done. I'm like, really? Wow. So different tastes for different folks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, And did you ever feel that Reanimator and From Beyond were kind of millstones? Did you ever feel like, I wish people would recognize me for other things I've done? Like for instance, um, one of our fellow podcasters, Nathan, he's on the podcast with us from Tennessee. And he said he wanted to let you know that he loved you in The Bold and the Beautiful. Oh, thank you. Um, actually, I loved my soap opera roles. Mm. I mean, I did as much soap opera as I did anything else. Yeah. And a lot of horror fans don't recognize me for that or don't even know that I did any of it. Um, and I'm glad that Nathan liked my part in The Bold and the Beautiful. Mm. I really loved my part on The Young and the Restless. I played... Um, I don't know if you guys got that over we there. D- we didn't get the... Because the, the, they were daily, were they? Were they Monday to Friday? Because yeah. we, we got I, the weekly I, ones. We got Dallas and Dynasty and Falcon Crest, right. those type of ones. But the okay. daily ones, we didn't really get. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. But, but well, how did Nathan watch? Um, Nathan, sorry, Nathan movie? lives in Tennessee. So. Oh, it's in Tennessee. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so he watched that show. Well, I was also on one called The Young and the Restless, and I played um, a borderline personality who had a lot of psychosis. <laughs> and my friend Amy, who's here, she's... Hi, Amy. She's of that show before she met me. Um <laughs> And that was a really fun character. And I played mm. that for almost six years. Yeah, because I was, I was speaking to your co-star in Shopping Mall, Russell Todd. And yeah. he also appeared in, uh, he was in Another World. Mm-hmm. And he mm-hmm. said it was really hard work, like literally working 50 weeks out of 52 a year. Yeah, mm. it's a lot of work. Yeah. Um, but the nice thing about soap operas is that you might work five days a week for a few weeks or a month and then you might work one or two days a week mm. depending mm. on your storyline so you'd get a little break mm. but when you were really on and your storyline was hot it was you could be learning 40 pages of dialogue a day it was very mm. very grueling you I mean, know are but, you, but, are you, but lovely i mean really i had a lot of fun but does that mean that you're off the market in terms of film work if you're tied to the soap it, it mostly does yeah. yes but then um, I think I was on The Bold and the Beautiful when Stuart asked me to do Space Truckers. All right. And, yeah. Filmed, and I filmed here in sunny the, Dublin. Yeah, yes. in Dublin. Yeah. <laughs> really had a lovely time. And I went to the producer and I said, I really would love to do this part. It's only for a few days. I'd probably have to go to Ireland for a week. And my part is acting opposite Dennis Hopper. I really don't want to pass this up. Mm. And they were kind enough to write me out of the script for a week so that I could go. But that doesn't normally happen. When mm. you're doing a soap opera, it, they don't let you go for anything. Mm. I mean, they were just out of the goodness of their heart. They just did me a favor. What happened to your character in the end? Was it something outlandish to write you out of the script completely? or They, um, originally, they were going to, it was, Bold and Beautiful was a half hour show and they were going to expand it to an hour. And they came to me one week and said, we're, we have the focus of the Forrester family is really big. We're now going to make the focus of the show the, the Warwick family and the Forrester family. So you guys are going to be really big. And um, uh, Ian, Ian uh, Buchanan was on the show with me. We played opposite one another. You might know him from, from Ireland. I think he started out there. Oh, or right. no, Scotland. I think oh. he started out in Scotland. Anyway... So I was really excited. I thought, oh, I'm going to get all this work and they're going to be profiling me and this is wonderful. And then about three weeks later, they came back and they said, oh, well, we decided that we're not going to expand to an hour. In fact, we're going to stay at a half an hour. And in fact, you're going to be let go and (laughs) we're going to make your character sort of crazy. I was a really nice girl on The Bold and the Beautiful. Mm. 
a bomb and um, sort of, you know, a moral compass type of character. They made me crazy for the next um, month or two months. And they do that yeah. so that when they kill you off the show or let you go, the audience doesn't get pissed off oh, at the producers. Right. Yes. So that's what they did. So they so they made me like a bad girl. Oh, <laughs> oh get rid of that Maggie Forster. She's horrible. <laughs> Um, what um, is it that makes you keep working with Stuart Gordon? What's the chemistry there like? You know, I he just feels like a really good friend, almost like a father type figure. Um, that was the first movie that he had ever done, Reanimator, yeah. and and because it came to be such a cult classic favorite, I think there's a nostalgia for wanting to work with you know, the people that were on that movie. And um, and I think a lot of filmmakers, if they work with people that they like or they get along with, they use them again and again. I, I think that's pretty common. Because mm -hmm. so, um, doesn't Kelly work with uh, Jim Wynorski a lot, the director does, of Chopin? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so, I did one other movie with Jim Wynorski. Yeah. Sometimes it's called Poison. It was with Kari Wurr. And then sometimes it's called, they call it uh, something else. It keeps... Sometimes they keep changing the name on it. Mm. Poison. I think if you look under poison, yeah. that comes up. All right. Yeah. Um, can you tell us about this new film you're working on? It's called You're Next. It sounds like it might be of interest to us and our listeners. Yes, it's definitely of the horror thriller genre. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It takes place in a big old mansion in the woods. And basically the premise is what happens to a family when they have a family reunion. And... Um, they come under attack from some strange forces. Oh, what, oh. what happened? Has it been filmed already, yes? Yeah, it's all done, and they're editing it right now. They're working very feverishly because there's a potential that it's going to get into the Toronto Film Festival. Mm -hmm. um, the, this company did A Horrible Way to Die uh, last year or two years ago, and it premiered in Toronto and did very well and got picked up and is being released by Anchor Bay. So right. um, they were... They were pretty sure that this film would, would get in as well. And we'll know on August 12th if it did get in. And um, it was a really fun movie. I played the mom in the movie now. You know, I've grown up from mm -hmm. the femme fatale roles. <laughs> and um, I have four children. And so I'm trying to keep it together while we're being attacked and under siege yeah. in the movie. And what's, what's the difference between making a film now in 2011 and your experience of working on the uh, those horror classics from the eighties. Um, you know, I think the acting and the storylines and everything was a little bit bigger and broader in the eighties, and um, and the style now, especially since you know there's a television in everybody's room and 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 with with paranormal activity and you know all these people making movies of people making movies about something and reality TV, I think it's brought the energy of the style of movie making to a level where it's so realistic. Now everything's very realistic um, and, and more subtle. And if, um, if Jim Wynorski came to you now and said he was planning a sequel to chopping mall and he wanted, uh, Susie's long lost twin sister to appear in it. W would you be tempted? Or aging grandmother. Um, <laughs> hey, sure, for, for fun. Yeah, sure. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. He was filming a movie recently. Somebody, somebody told me um, they made a uh, documentary on him. I don't know if anybody's seen that or not. Mm. Somebody just told me about it last night. And they, they were profiling him during this documentary on a movie he was working on, on called The the. The Witches of Breastwick. <laughs> so, that's the type of movie Jim Wynorski's doing yes. now and mm -hmm. has done those exploitation movies. Yes. So I don't well, know he, how he, I could He it does about four or five a year, I think, from if you look at what? his CV. He, right. he directs about four or five films a year, yes. it seems. Yeah. He's still going strong. I mean, yeah. he's been doing that since, you know, I've been working with him. So well, well, how many movies has he done? I don't know. Yeah, well, Chopping Mall was his second film. So he's mm -hmm. been working constantly since 1986. Yeah, That's a lot of, let's count those up. Yeah. That's a well, lot of movies. Barbara, thank you so much for talking to us this morning. Thank you. It was a pleasure. Okay, and good luck for the future. And we look forward to seeing uh, your next, which is due for release in 2012.
Yes, thank you. That's the sound of us being locked in here all night. The security doors don't open till six. Oh no, we're never gonna get out of here. Yes, we are. The phone's dead. The computer must have taken control. <laughs> well, what about that? The air duct. Wait, we take it down to the parking levels. We're out of here. Let's go for it. <laughs> And that was Barbara Crampton. And as I was saying, completely starstruck. I was not just um, speaking over Skype. I was speaking over video Skype so I could see into her lovely apart- or her house or apartment, whatever it was. And it, oh, I just never thought in a million years I'd be speaking to Barbara Crampton. Um, she mentions in an interview that uh, there was a film she couldn't quite recall that is sometimes called Poison. Uh, it's more often called Thy Neighbor's Wife. And it was directed by Jim Wynorski in 2001. Uh, and the plot is a scorned woman plots revenge for her husband's suicide by in- Grating herself as a housekeeper for a dysfunctional Beverly Hills family to first alienate and then emotionally and physically destroy them. It sounds kind of like the so both. It's kind of like hand that rocks or the hand that rocks the cradle. Actually, it does yeah, completely. It does, <laughs> completely. <isn't> it? <laughs> yeah. And that that film that she's going to be in sounds great, doesn't it? That, that yes. new one. So yeah, looking forward to seeing that. So mm. I'm. I mean, if you're listening, um, well, hopefully you've got this far, but I mean, uh, what more could you ask for? Four cast interviews um, from Chopping Mall, which is um, fantastic. And we've got many more things lined up for the future, so keep on listening. But um, guys, have we got anything else we want to say about Chopping Mall? Well, Nathan had something interesting to say about connecting Chopping Mall to Psycho. Yeah. Well, also, uh, that movie, Thy Neighbor's Wife, a.k.a. Poison, as we all know, Barbara Crampton was on my favorite soap opera, The Bold and the Beautiful. And um, she also, her husband in that movie was also on The Bold and the Beautiful. So that's just some trivia for our horror slash soap opera fans. Of which um, there's, there's you and there's um, Amanda. Amanda. By I, think, I think that's about it. <laughs> I don't think Amanda watches Bold and the Beautiful, though. She watches like General Hospital and All My Children and One Life to Live and those kind of shows, I think. So, unfortunately, she doesn't share my love for B&B. Oh. But... Barbara Crampton, um, you know, she was uh, obviously in Chopping Mall and in The Bold and the Beautiful. And you remember in the interview, she said that they decided to make her character on Bold and the Beautiful crazy before they wrote her out. Well, what Mm -hmm. they did was they made her character go crazy and she kidnapped another woman and held her hostage at the psycho house. Which was kind of fun. What? Uh Interesting. In Hollywood. Yeah, she held her hostage at the psycho house at Universal. Oh, really? oh, so it's actually they. She goes to the Universal lot. That's what where it says. Yeah, because it? she had like a guy I think who was a guard that was one of her like henchmen that helped her like uh you know like kidnap this woman and like they kept her hostage there at the psycho house for uh it, I think that storyline might have lasted a you know a few weeks or a month or something before you know um, her character ended up leaving the show, but. It was kind of funny to see her play like a crazy character holding somebody hostage at the psycho house. Yeah, because she, she said her character was squeaky clean up until that moment and sort of just her flips character, in. Yeah. yeah. That's what's so funny is her character was totally like the mom, baked cookies, you know, really nice. And it was weird because just like it was like flip of a coin or flip of a light switch. Suddenly her character just went crazy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the that's wonderful soap world of soaps you know? for you, yeah. isn't it? Mm-hmm. Actually, one little soap. Um, story is uh, is in this country of Emmerdale and we were talking about um, Slaughter High and one of the characters in Emmerdale which is you obviously wouldn't get this in America and I don't I don't watch it very often but most people know what Emmerdale is if in in the UK and it's basically a soap opera set in a small farming town or village and there's lots of people going, ooh, or whatever, something, you know, that kind of very bad <laughs> kind of um, thing. But the, one of the main characters in um, in Emmerdale got his arse out in um, Slaughter High. So there you go. That's my little soap opera trivia. Soap so, opera stroke mm. arse trivia, yeah. Yes. Or mm. ass trivia, whichever way. Ass trivia. Bottom trivia. Bottom trivia, Bottom trivia yes. Okay. okay. Well, okay. Um, yeah, sorry, go on. I was just going to say I have a few other things to say about uh, Chopping Mall, and that is the score by Chuck Serino. Anyone else like it as much as me? I love it. I, was yes. very I, I think it's very it's 80s. fantastic, actually. Justin? So bombastic yeah. and over the no, top. I do, I do. I mean, back in the 80s, I didn't like that. I mean, it just sounded like everything else, but it screams 80s now, so it's got that real nostalgia to it, and it's kind of, yeah, yeah it's fun. 
Yeah, I like and it. he's worked a lot with uh, Jim Minorski over the years, and he's branched out into other areas as well. He's been a director, an actor, he's done special effects, he's done cinematography, he's been an editor, and he's written and produced films. And uh, if you are in- interested in the music, it was reissued on a double bill CD with the music from Deathstalker 2, oh. if you're so inclined. Excellent. Mm. I'm uh, heading out to Tower Records yeah. right now. Pick that up. <laughs> Speaking of, um, of the music... Um, do you remember that scene where they're all in the uh, furniture store and they're dancing? Hmm. They were dancing to a track called Street Walking, which, is be- which was pilfered from another uh, Roger Corman production. But uh, it's quite obvious that the music wasn't being played on set because the dancing is all out of time, which explains why they're, you know, they have, seem to have about as much rhythm as the Reynolds girls, which is a reference that Joseph and Nathan probably won't get, but you should, Justin. Unfortunately, I do get that. Really. Yes. yes but, <laughs> I've uh, heard of the Reynolds girls, but yeah, yes. I wanted to say, you know, now that we're talking about music, I'm really surprised neither of you have mentioned Susie or Toya this episode. Not oh, yet, no. We, we, we've had a truce, haven't yes. we? Yes. <gasps> the new well, Batman. We're it? trying to, like, fuel fire to that and in the truce, Joseph. When did I hear this? This I was not told of this truce. No, I've, d- I've decided to yes. draw a dignified line under it. And my mother always said to me, don't kick, sorry, don't kick her dog when she's down. So I thought, you know, and I thought about Toya and I thought, really, what have I been doing the last um, year? And I've been kicking her and I won't do it anymore. So I'm sorry, Toya. Well, I'm ending so the war. You're calling her a dog. You're calling her a dog. Yes, he is calling her a dog. And I'm ending this war by with the following statement. Kajagoogoo are better than Bauhaus. <laughs> Yeah, well, that's I have true, no idea it? who Kajagoogoo is. I've never heard that's of this before. Too <laughs> shy, shy, hush, hush. Oh my god, that's who sings that. Yeah, yes, that's so, Kajagoogoo. Yeah. Oh, all right. Well, this will then. probably be our last Toya and Susie episode. Yeah. So yeah, right. Well. <laughs> They'll come back. They they always come back. They're like they will come they're back. like Jason. Yeah, they're like, like Jason. They always come back. Exactly. Exactly. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well. um... Anything else to say about Yeah, this? just yes. to say that, that... Sorry, Joseph. Is no, it? you go ahead. You go ahead. Okay, I was just going to say Nick Segal, who plays Greg in the film, is in real estate now. Uh, John Terleski, who played the square-jawed Mike, he's a director now. He does a lot of television shows, uh, most famously probably Ugly Betty. And uh, IMDb credits him as writing a song on the High Fidelity soundtrack, which I thought, hmm, that can't be right. So I did some investigating, and I was right. It's not right. There are actually two John Terleskis out there in um, Celebrity Land. Uh, the second John Trelesky is the lead singer of a band called Brother JT. And uh, they have a song on the High Fidelity soundtrack called Little Did I Know, but it's not uh, it's not Mike from Chopping Mole. Hmm. That's all my trivia okay, burnt well, out I've now. Got, I've got one little thing, which I'm just kind of little discussion point um, on this, because I know, Joseph, you've got something to say, you want to say as well. But it was just, do we think, because Jim Minorski has, all, has now made a career out of not to put too fine a point on it, ripping off other movies and putting large breasts into them. And that, that's, a, that's a great niche to be into. I've got nothing against that. Great trash aesthetic to do that. But what's actually possibly ironic about it is the fact that um, Chopping Mall seemed to actually preempt two other much bigger movies. One of them was Short Circuit, and the other, of course, was 1987's Robocop. Um, where you have uh, in Short Circuit the the robot in in that looks very much like Robert mm. Short's robots in um, Chopping Mall, and of course in RoboCop what you have is robots going bad and um, starting to kill people. So I do wonder if Chopping Mall was actually an inspiration to those kind of slightly well much bigger Hollywood um, movies. What do you think? It's a possibility. No, I'd I have say. Short- I- Go ahead. So I was just going to say Short Circuit was released in May of 1986. So it was probably in production around the same time as right. Chopping Mall. So there was, that was probably coincidental. Robocop, on the other hand, um, I can see the similarity. Yeah, I'm, I'm not wow. sure. I'd, I'd, have to, I'd have to think how successful Chopping Mall was at the time. Yeah, Would they have seen it, I wonder? But somebody might have seen it and said, mm. oh, that, you know, nobody's going to watch that movie, so we can rip it True. off. I mean, yeah. was, was Robocop, was it a comic or was it just an original idea? I don't... It's, a, uh, it's an original, I think, is it? Yeah, I believe it was an original idea. Okay. so I could be wrong. I, I don't really read comic books, so I'm, no. I'm not sure. 
but yeah, it'd be interesting if um, if the whoever wrote RoboCop had sat through um, Chopping Ball or Killbots on a kind of rainy, sort of rainy sort of Saturday sort of afternoon at the Flicks, mm. which kind of brings us on neatly to your story, Joseph, doesn't it? Yes, there was a theater here in town, uh, actually in Georgia, um, back in the day called Southgate Five, and what they did is when they'd have these horror films showing, they'd decorate their their lobby and all kinds of uh, decorations. And one of my earliest memories, um, I don't remember who took me, but basically, you know, being 10 or 11 years old, uh, back back in the 80s or whatever, uh, you didn't you could get into an R-rated film. Uh, you, as long as your parents just dropped you off and like waved at the person selling the tickets, you know, they'd let you in. But one of my earliest memories is, um, seeing Friday the 13th part six. And they had, uh, you know, they had a, a coffin with Jason coming out of it. It was like animatronic, you know, to purport the fact that Jason lives, but, uh, kind of swifting in, uh, from that to chopping mall. My brother had went to see Chopping Mall when it was released uh, at Southgate 5, and he remembered um, they had this really, really large, you know, those cardboard standees that promote films. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, they had one of uh, the killer robots in the lobby, and he said he didn't really know anything about the movie. He just saw the poster, and he's like, ooh, a new horror film. I'll go see that. So he went to see it, and he said there were – uh, three other people in the fa- in the theater when he was watching it, and one of them actually walked out on the movie. And um, I don't know. I just thought that was an interesting little story. Was that was that opening opening week or the first week? Yeah, it was. Uh, it was the first weekend when it opened, actually. Ooh, yeah. And they had I, in the I, lobby. In the lobby, they had that giant. Um, he was telling me how they had that giant cardboard standee, and I was thinking to myself, I would kill to get my hands on something like that to. As mm. as a decoration for my house. Well, I I went to see the Pamela Anderson classic Barbed Wire on its opening day of release in Dublin. Uh, it was a six o'clock screening, so you'd expect it to be, to be quite full. Uh, I went with my cousin, and we were one. Uh, we were two of three people there. Because mm. mm. I went to see. But you know, I'm sorry. I was going to say I went to see Valentine, the um, the late, well, the early two thousand ish sort of um slash movie and uh th- we were one, oh, well two of three people in that um so it's funny isn't it when you go and see films you think it will be popular and then they turn out to be complete bombs yeah mm. Mm. but like i was saying earlier about the uh sherman oaks galleria being torn down to make way for a, a different uh location they did the same with uh southgate i mean this theater used to you know embrace horror films they used to you know, show marathons and they used to decorate the lobby and it was just a really fun place to go to see a movie. But, you know, they tore it down to kind of put up a, a, a multiplex, which is kind of cold and sterile. And hmm. uh, Nathan, you know which one I'm talking about. It's right down the road from Grant Grant. Oh, the yeah. Battlefield, uh, whatever it's called. Battlefield Parkway or something, cinema. Or yeah, something. yeah. But you know, a, it's, Speaking of Grant Grant, people can actually see him now, can't they? They can sort of see him. He's they hidden can sort behind of see him on, on the Hysteria Continues Facebook page. Yes, he's he hidden. He preferred that his identity be kind of hidden. He wants to keep <laughs> this air of mystery about him. He's yes. pretentious like that. Yeah, I was just surprised uh, to hear that his name wasn't even Grant. It's his, his last, last name's name. Grant. Oh, is it? Oh, sorry. <laughs> his real name is Greg Grant, but we call him Grant Grant. Oh, he's, right. it's, it's suddenly becoming clear. He's. he's <laughs> He's um fistinging himself is in that photo, isn't he? Which is quite no. We yeah. took that one down. We oh, took that oh, one down. Oh, all right. right. He's okay. wearing a giant beard and sunglasses in this new one. Okay. okay. So he was aware. He was aware identity. that. He put, he, when I say fisting, he wasn't actually fisting himself. He he's putting. He was mad making fist. fun of. Uh, he was making fun of a character from Saturday Night Live, I believe. Okay. Yeah, that's what he was dressed up as for that Halloween. One thing you guys got to know about. Grant Grant is that when he watches a movie that he's afraid is going to be too scary or have jump scares, he will put his fingers up to his eyes and watch through his fingers because he says that makes it less scary. Really? He did that oh. the entire did time that, while yeah. we're watching Scream yeah. Time. His eyes, both both hands were over his eyes. And he's like, oh no, it's, there's going to be a jump scare coming. And we were laughing at him the whole time. Oh. Mm, you see, I could oh, understand that with Halloween, good. but with Scream Time? Yeah, exactly. Well, there's that one scene. 
there's that one scene in the second story where she opens the door and that guy just runs past the door holding the knife. And, and that even scared me. And he had his eyes True. covered and he's like, oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> but that's Grant Grant. Um, if you're curious as to who the hell this person is, just go to our Facebook page and he's on there. Along with a Susie and Toya graphic. Exactly. Mm. Yes. You see how okay. I brought that back? I brought that yes. back. Well, next week we will do something special with Toya and Susie, perhaps. I don't know. But one thing I was going to say <laughs> is um, just to come back to what you said, Eric, about Dawn of the, D- of the Dead. And um, I like the, um, the Romero version, but I've always said, well, not always said, but um, I actually prefer watching the remake of Dawn of the Dead. I think it's a, a much more fun movie. Um, and so, so I don't, you know, I think out of all horror movies, I think Dawn of the, Dawn of the Dead is probably one of the most overrated. Um, oh, well, I'm glad somebody agrees. I mean, yeah. I do like it as well, but I find yeah, I like it overlong it, but... and uninvolving. Mm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I don't, and, and also that kind of lurch into um, slapstick, um, mm, I just yeah. think kind of ruins it for me. See, I, I, I love Dawn of the Dead as well. I think it's got a very good social commentary, but it's not a movie you can go back and watch over and over because it's really not very entertaining. Mm. Yeah. So anyway, that's our controversial opinions for this week. Yes. Um, <laughs> I think we are well we're at the two and a half hour mark, I think. Um, and I'm just going to say, apologise for possibly some sound issues um, in this podcast. Uh, I've got a little bit of an echo on on mine, and we, it's unfortunately what happens when we using Skype because we're literally not quite in the four corners of the of the planet. But uh, it seems to get slightly worse throughout when we're doing stuff, and so so now I kind of I've got like a split second echo, which makes it quite difficult actually to to um, uh, talk because you're kind of constantly listening to yourself, repeating yourself, and you've had that a little bit, Eric, haven't you? Mm, yeah, I've noticed a few sound. So and you've had that a little bit, haven't you, Eric? <laughs> oh, he's try, uh, yes. trying to mess with your mind, guy. I know. <laughs> so, I'm but sorry. anyway, so, so it was just to say that um, hopefully that hasn't. I'm sure it hasn't spoiled your enjoyment, but um, just so you let you know, we work through these issues, and um, hopefully we're going to get them sorted in the future. So, but um, I... on another uh, chopping mall, uh, mm. this uh, this podcast costs us an arm and a leg. Ah, uh, yes, great um, tagline, which we're going to yes. be doing our favourite taglines, aren't we, top threes at some point, um, and also yes. top three trailers. Uh, I can't remember, what did we decide we're going to do for the next show? I think it was trailers, wasn't it? Was it was trailers for okay. the mini-sode. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Uh, which may air before this one, just so everybody listening oh, doesn't yes. get confused. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'm <laughs> confused. Yeah, we're, we're, all, we're all out of, uh, out of whack. Uh, we're out of uh, sync with our, our podcast. Yes. Due to holidays. Yes. Yes, we're on holidays. I am Susie, and I admit that I am inferior to Toya. And even Yaz and the plastic population. There you go. Did you hear that? That was the robots from Chopping Mall again. What were they saying? saying, saying that, they were saying that Susie is inferior to Toya and Yaz and the plastic population. Uh-huh. Eric, you just can't let it go, can you? <laughs> You've got to find a way to one up him, Justin. Well, I, well, I I'm gonna... even. I, he's always one upping me. Don't encourage him. <laughs> no. I guess I, that's I, too, gonna... I, I don't remember. I forget every Susie Toya argument. All well, I know there was, was no somebody's... arguments until it was either you or. <laughs> anyway, there so... we go. There's some Susie. <laughs> it's not no. Susie Saturday. It's not Susie. Well, it's Susie Saturday every day in our house. Hopefully, join us for a slightly more coherent episode next time. Thank you. Have a nice day.